Добрый день, друзья и подруги. Мы с вами снова в эфире. И мы рады с Леной Никаноле приветствовать нашего первого гостя второго дня. Oh, I'm speaking Russian, sorry for that. <laughs> Too tired. <laughs> so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of our conference Saving the World. Uh, and uh, let me uh, introduce our first guest, uh, Lev Manovich, and uh, we will just continue to his talk without hesitation. Thank you, Lev, for joining us. Great. Okay. Um, am I on? Am I on? Yeah. Great. Sure. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to a very interesting hours. It's midnight for me in Korea, so I hope I can stay until early morning to watch everything. Um, so at the last moment, you know, as people often do, I decided to change what I will talk about since I only have 10 minutes. And rather than uh, showing you some results of my current or recent projects, you know, I want to share a few uncomfortable, perhaps, or even radical ideas or reflections I have on what's going on in the world. Okay? Um, so, uh, the first thing is that, uh, obviously, right, you know, the corona pandemic is a tragedy, and the tragedy maybe hasn't really started yet. Uh, if, indeed, the economic and social impacts of this will be as large as economists predict, this, indeed, will be tragedy, and it will affect you know, billions of lives. But even in the tragedy, sometimes there are some positive things. So the positive thing, as I see it, is that this tremendous, unsustainable growth of contemporary high culture, which we saw in the last 25 years, suddenly stopped. Right? So suddenly there are no biennials to fly to, there are no academic, academic conferences to go to, but you can attend them, you know, virtually on Zoom, and I only see advantages of doing things online. I enjoy teaching online. So to give you some idea why I call this growth unprecedented, um, for the last two years, I have been working on a project which I call Elsewhere. And the idea of this project is to start to try to understand, to try to map, and quantitatively analyze A quantitative analyze uh, uh, okay. uh, on my screen uh, you know instead of me I'm seeing some other person but uh, anyway I'll just should I continue yeah please please do uh, uh, why is there some, some, some young corporate guy instead of me on the screen on my screen at least yeah, I don't see myself. Uh, it's it, it's okay. just a list of the speakers. It's just the thumbnails. Okay. It's speakers. a picture. It's a picture of a guy. Anyway, yes. okay, I will continue. Uh, but people can see me now, or what? Yes, of course. All good. You can. But I can't. I can. Okay, anyway, I'll just continue. Um, so to give you some idea, right, about this, about this growth and why it may be a good idea, but suddenly it had to come to a halt. Over the last two years, I have been working on a project to try to collect you know, big data, which will give us for the first time some quantitative ideas about the growth and diffusion of contemporary culture worldwide in the current globalization period, which let's say begins around 1991, which is simultaneously you know, the collapse of communist states and the invention of World Wide Web. So we collected uh, data on millions of events from uh, sources like Meetup, Behance, Eflux, and a number of others. And uh, what I found out is that we basically counted, right? How many physical, physical cultural events, you know, meetings, exhibition openings, conferences, you know, festivals, and so on, have been uh, listed in the sources. And you know, where do we have more, where do we have less? What's the distribution of contemporary culture worldwide? Uh, you know, and every source has its own dynamics, uh, but 
on the average, right, when I took eight sources, which amount to four and a half million you know, physical, cultural, intellectual events uh, between, let's say, 2007, approximately 2019. So just over 10 years, 2008 to 2019, the number of such events increased 10 times. Right? So there are approximately, on the average, 10 times more cultural, intellectual events today than 10 years ago. And um, it does seem to me that uh, while this diffusion and this growth leads to perhaps more and more people being involved in maybe the general level of discussion being raised, uh, it's also very hard right, to find time to step back and to reflect. So you meet all these artists who become artists only because they want to have this travel lifestyle. Um, so that's, I think, one thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that uh, I find it very surprising that every so-called intellectual, so-called artist, you know, academic journal, cultural institution and museum now has to make some statement, artwork, an article, a conference about the crisis and the pandemic. So I'm not sure why. It seems to me that almost people, institutions want to check in. Yes, I, 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 I said something, I'm in. But you know, you can have these conversations with your friends over Facebook or you know, in the kitchen over tea. Why we have to stop all the other cultural intellectual research activity and only talk about this crisis? The fact that everybody does talk about this crisis every time I go to some academic journal you know, or conference site or museum site, and immediately I see some, something about this crisis. It's also very unprecedented because for the first time, I think in the history of the modern world, it has become synchronized. No, no event before, and no event five years ago, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago led to such synchronization, where suddenly attention of billions of people, uh, focused by media outlets, but also attention of academics and artists, focused by very respected institutions, are all about one event. And I don't want to prevent you right, from talking about it, but maybe it's a good time to learn something new or to continue project to get deeper because it does take 10, 15 years to become good and to reach some depth and some originality in what you do. Uh, so if we become a culture where every day we react to something new and change what we're doing, and of course, what I'm doing is ironically, ironically referring to the biggest problem of new media art, my field where I was you know, active for 35 years, where every few years, the media art changes its orientation. You know, we talk about interactivity. A few years later, we talk about VR, ER, artificial intelligence. You know, and we never reach any depth, right? And then we wonder why we're not in museums and in the art books. But if you know, our whole intellectual, cultural, artistic world becomes like this, uh, basically, we become you know, as profound or as superficial as the world of news, right? We, you know, we newsmakers have to fill their channels. We have to broadcast something every 24 hours. So for them, virus, it's the best possible thing because now we have a story we can talk about, but we can have many, many other stories. Um, so this is kind of all I wanted to say. Right? So one point is about how the growth of contemporary culture and intellectual life has become completely so unsustainable, both in terms of flying around, but also unsustainable because nobody can follow all the conferences, events, are the analysis. Um, and uh, you know, just for myself, suddenly I stopped traveling. And I've never felt happy. I haven't felt as happy as I've been feeling the last two months in years. Of course, I'm very sad and I care about the world, but personally, psychologically, I've never been happier because only now I realize how much energy all the travel was taking. Um, so you know, that's what I want to say. So I hope that in fact, things will not go back to normal. I hope that the changes in the, the culture becoming more digital, but also kind of people maybe spending more time in their studios, with their computers, working, thinking, as opposed to flying around and going to endless events. Uh, it will be a big change. Um, and perhaps we'll, we'll start seeing art, which, which will be as interesting as the best avant-garde art of the 20th century. Thank you, and maybe I'll be able to answer a few questions. Thanks, Lev. We will now join the conversation. Uh, Helen.
Anna, do you want to join? If anyone else is willing to join, please raise your hand and I will bring your cameras to the discussion as well. Okay, so uh, looks like it's just three of us for now. Uh, thanks, Lev, for your talk. That was quite uh, interesting uh, insight that uh, the amount of events uh, like raised that much 10 times and at the same time uh, the pandemics could synchronize even this amount of discourse and this is very interesting but yes. have you ever uh, tried to look into the uh, how it uh, relates to other types of events so is it sort of intellectual and cultural events uh, more dominating over other types of events or have the same type of growth uh, showed up in other types of events Sure. Well, you know, of course, what is cultural, intellectual, artistic events, it's also open for question. I mean, basically, you know, we selected like various data sources. Uh, the biggest one is Meetup, 3 million events. We also look at EFLUX, Art and Education mailing list, Behance. We also look in Russia, we look at TED, uh, no, so TimePad, and we also look at TED local events. So it's all very different. And uh, when I say, you know, 10 times, it's the average. Like meetup grew a lot. The difficulty is that as often when you deal with phenomena, right, and you try to study physical phenomena through digital data, it's not clear if you're actually studying reality or if you're studying kind of a digital thing. So maybe more countries and more people discovered these platforms and started advertising these platforms, right? So maybe reality is not 10 times, maybe it's five times. Um, what I was going to talk about, but I decided it's maybe too narrow, is my particular analysis of growth with the analysis. Right, so the number of binaries kind of, yeah, doubled in the 90s uh, and then became even bigger, but it's still not 10 times, right? But of course, our binary is a big event, it requires big commitment, it's kind of you basically commit to putting it on every two years. Um, so it's so different. Uh, I know that, for example, just our finishing, for example, in, in sciences where people do keep track and try to quantify what they're doing, right? There's research on the number of art, scientific articles being published every year. Uh, so it's been growing progressively since the 19th century. So now it grows about 8% per year. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound that much, but you know, think if you put money in a bank and it grows 8%, it actually could be a huge, huge amount, right? So um, I think that our systems like search engines, right, or web directories, they're just not simply not adequate anymore for us to keep track, to understand, to have a landscape of this information. So I actually think that the biggest challenge for programmers, designers, and indie artists is to create really different paradigms for how we can navigate this content uh, and uh, kind of move forward and just not be lost in, uh, in reading, reading endless, endless programs. And frankly, like I don't even browse, I don't even browse the web for 10 years because it's simply too much. Uh, we also have a question uh, from YouTube, uh, from our subscribers uh, that ask questions online. And yeah. Albert, Figu Albert Figurt uh, wants to ask you, why do you think, Aliyev, that we were resisting to total digitization of events and practices before the pandemic shock? Yeah. Well, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so, um, so think about what's happening now, right? So the places, right, which were closed first and which will probably remain closed until the last moment are cultural places, right? So it's theaters, right? galleries, museums, uh, and, and club, right? clubs and so on. So it turns out that the culture, in fact, what separates culture today from everything else is that culture requires people to go to space. So it's actually not digital. And certainly, I don't want to advocate moving it all to a digital space, right? We don't have you know, various sensors, we can't meet people and so on. Um, but I think, you know, I think uh, what I will hope will happen is not simply with museums or universities, right? We'll put more content online, but we'll start inventing, innovating and creating new media forms the way it was actually happening in the 90s, right? Uh, so the current forms work, but definitely museum can do something better than simply you know, give you some like online tour, right? Of galleries or video or something else, right? So I hope that it will uh, let the more institutions starting to innovate into digital communication, basically inventing, right? New formats 
the way email is a new format, right? The way video conference is a new format, but I think we need more, right? So that's my answer. But it still didn't happen. I mean, uh, uh, everyone is trying to do something online, but mostly it's just uh, some, I don't know, presentations, conferences, right, right. and things like this. The, it's it's so, not so, so, so different. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, I don't want to take too much time, but if you allow me one minute. So as I said, I have some advantage because I've been in this kind of new media digital culture for 35 years. And what I think kind of happened is that in the early 90s, the computers became like a bit faster. So it was a period from 93 to about 2007, where we saw lots of innovation, both in art, interactive art, right, VR, but also on a corporate level, right? So, I mean, we have, we have a web, you know, we have a graphic browser, we have social networks, you know, we have 300, 300 videos, we have lots of innovations. But I think what happened like around 2009, the social networks become so big, like Facebook has two and a half billion people, they afraid to change the interface, right? So the new media from being very innovative to suddenly became kind of very conservative because it became a new TV. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, I don't think we have seen radically new interfaces, right? Or radically new ways to organize communication in the last 10 years. Okay, maybe you can count, maybe you can talk about TikTok. So uh, maybe because it became so popular, People are using it, and it also became very commercial. So people are afraid to alienate subscribers. So how do we bring back the feeling, feeling of avant-garde? You know, maybe it will happen when the current phones change and we become like become like a rollable newspaper because also this form factor of a phone really limits your creativity. Um, so we'll see what happens. You know, see what happens. Uh, thank you, Lev, uh, for your answer and for your talk and for joining us. I know that it was quite tough for you time-wise because you're in a very different time zone. <laughs> so thanks for finding me. Okay. Thank the you light. so much. I'm looking forward to watching the rest. Thanks a lot. Y yes. Thank you. And our next speaker is Martin Medal. Um, Martin, are you here? Uh, Martin, would you uh, turn your microphone? Yes, so now I will uh, leave you. <laughs> Hi. Let's see, because I also want to share my my folder. So I should start right now, no? Let's yeah, see. Yeah. T -t 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 <laughs> I had everything prepared, so I hope I will be uh -huh. able to do it. Okay. So yeah, I will put my clock. At least we have like a some sort of idea. Uh, well, my name is uh, Martin Nadal. Wait, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm an artist. Uh, currently, I'm living, I'm, I'm spending this pandemic in Berlin, but I usually am based in Linz, although I'm, I'm from Spain originally. And I've been like working in the last years in projects related with, from the art point of view, in visualization and blockchain with my colleague Cesar Escudero. But in this you know, I will use this talk to talk about my latest projects because I really didn't know what to talk about. So I prepared this project I'm working on and the project that I think is in some way very related with how the world is, is right now and it's called Fango. That is Fango, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google Obfuscator. Also, it's like, yeah this little joke that in Spanish fango means mud, so it's like to get everything dirty. That's like the way the, the, this project is, is named this way. It's like the shortest description is like fango is a defense weapon against surveillance capitalism. And basically it's like a, mobile, like a charger, like a phone charger that it takes control of, of your phone. And when your phone is, is charging, is uh, generating a lot of traffic and a lot of interaction with your phone, even me by the computer. So the big companies, they don't know really if it's you or it's the, or it's, uh, or it's the, the device that is taking control of the smartphone. So basically this, this is uh, the strategy is obfuscation to try to break the, in some way the surveillance capitalism and the motivation of this project well, this is a photograph of the device, yeah, I have. <laughs> and so it looks like a normal power, power charger. 
And also the motivation was like this, uh, this book and the work of Susanna Zuboff. And for me, like the most, what really changed, because I knew that there was like this thing going on about surveillance capitalism, but I was not really so interested about that because I had the perception that it was basically that I was like going to receive more or less advertisements and I really didn't care so much. But when you have like a wider understanding of the of, of all the interaction, um, for me it's like very important this quote that is in the in the slide that is like uh, in similar way as the industrial capitalism through mechanics turns nature work into a commodity, such as real estate or labor surveillance capitalism turns experience that occur in the private sphere of human being into commodities that can be bought and sold. For me, that was like super shocking that even like the, the slight interaction with, with the device or my messages with my girlfriend or my ex-girlfriend or whatever, could uh, some big companies could extract value out of it. For me, it was like very shocking. And that's when I start thinking about it and how about an art, pro, about an art project and, and yeah, that, how to be conscious about all these, all these mechanics, no? So let's see if I can be good. So um, also uh, a lot of it, I was, I read like this book of Fuscation by Finn Branton that is a, a professor in, in, in New York University. And also he had like this project that was like also a lot of inspiration for me that is called Ad Nauseam. It's, I think it's like from me 2000, I really don't know the date, maybe, but I, maybe it's like, 2000, I don't really don't know. But basically how it does is like a browser extension that is clicking constantly to the, all the different advertisements. So the big companies that are like tracking all, all your interactions, they really don't know what are you looking at and what are you interested in. No? So that was like a lot of, of, insp of, of inspiration. Also, the Chinese click farms for me were like kind of, you know, the first time I saw them, it were like very shocking. So this was also very clearly influenced my work. And yeah, so basically this is uh, how the device, the device is, is electronically very simple. I am not very skilled with electronics. So basically it's like a very small microcontroller, a small power power charger dismantled and then assembled with the shape that you saw in the first slides. This is like the, the 3D modeling that I did like the, for the 3D printing. This is like the first the first prototype that was shown. So it's like it looks like a like a normal power charger but, but like slightly different. Yeah. And this is like the first, uh, the first exhibition it was shown. I have to say that this project, as like most of the project, I thought of it and I applied to a lot of, of places, but I got rejected, most of them. But then suddenly, I don't know, I got accepted in, in this exhibition that happened in New York, that it was like very, very interesting. And this is something that happens to me sometimes that is like I apply with projects that they don't exist you know they are like in my mind and I usually I apply for for funding but you know and I try to, to get it and I don't I'm not very successful but you know the what I put this as like is because you know it's like when I got like the letter saying that oh it would be great if you could show the work I have to say that there was no work so it's, it's when I start when I had to start like printing and designing and all that no so this is how the final product uh, was shown and this is how it was like displaced as you can see it was like the device was well, the, the smartphone was hung to, into the wall and then the fango was like sending uh, different queries and so on okay. there is a video i don't know if you will be able to see it i hope so so you can see that it's like basically in the exhibition area is basically interacting by a uh, invisible hand. I, I, I find it very hypnotizing in the exhibition, in the exhibition area, and I kind of like it also. Uh, so and so that was pretty cool because then after that exhibition in the United States, I got, uh, there was like this article written in, in Vice about, about the project which for me was like very, made me very happy. And also the, this is another exhibition that happened in Norway. 
And this is also an article that they wrote in, in, in Spanish by this author, uh, Marta Peirano, that also talks about surveillance capitalism in, in, in some way. Yeah, I'm trying to, to calculate. And also, at, uh, luckily, I got like a European, you know, this European Media Artist Resident Exchange in the National Foundation in Athens. But due to the pandemic, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot do it. So I probably we will do it remotely. And I wanted to talk about different, you know, since this is like a very informal talk, I wanted to, to show like the latest ideas and maybe to, to have some sort of feedback from the public. Um, so we have like... Uh, Interaction that is like what we, you know, Fango works in three levels. One, the first of, of them is interaction, that is like examples. It's like this device is capable of controlling the mobile phone, generating traffic and interactions in, in with the idea of, of adding noise to the to the information and to all the interaction. So the big companies they really don't know when is the user uh, using the the device or the um, or the or the fango device so fango has something that is kind of interesting that because it has even though that it looks like a charger it, it has it's able to understand the interfaces so it's able to see what is the like so it's not just random movements it really knows what it's doing in some way you know so for example is you know it's it's able to understand what is the like button what are the coordinates so in in that way it's, it's kind of it's kind of smart also, it's in the location. It's, that is something that I wanted to work on, and it's, you know, I'm talking about project things that I'm going to do during during the residency. Also, it's like I wanted to spoof the geolocation. So when I'm sleeping, maybe the you know all the companies and my phone in in the virtual world would be like walking around the city. That is something I liked a lot. And I think that opens the idea to make like some more creative works because this one is more like uh, like some sort of guerrilla device. And also the image. And this is the latest the, the latest thing and I hope to finish my 10 minutes on time. And this also when you take a photograph all the photographs that you know is super important for the big companies to have access to all our photographs, so they can train their systems. No, so basically, when you take a photograph, Google is super happy to to able to store it because it's going to be able to to, to extract information out, out of it. No, so I am like working in an application that, in some way, in a very very simple way, encrypts the all the images in your phone and decrypted. So it's like when you take a photograph, it encrypts the photograph, it's, it's stored in your in your phone. And then when you want when you are going to, to see it, it will it will be the, the encrypted again. No? So uh, for example, this is like one of the purpose of it is that you have a photograph and you can see that this is like a person with a confidence of 0 0.9, but then one that is very stupidly encrypted and suddenly it's like it turns into an artwork. I don't know why they think it's, you know, it could be like a, some sort of artwork. I think that was also some sort of funny. But also what is interesting is that uh, since it, it runs in the in the screen very closely, in the data center they have an image that they, that they can't extract information out of it. Also in your mobile phone and it's just when you're going to see it, that it will be like deciphered and you will be able to consume you know, to have your your information, your, your image, and to enjoy it if you enjoy your images. Uh, the idea is to, you know, to break this mechanic of extraction of value of our own images. So that is like the research I am doing lately. And that's like my my talk. It's over. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, for your talk. We have uh, Lev with us also still. He wants to ask a question and maybe Eliana will join us. So uh -huh. I will ask the, those who want to join uh, yeah. the uh, uh, talk to turn the cameras. Sure. Uh, cool. Ready? Lef, do you want to turn your camera and microphone on? I will also try to stop the screen sharing thing, but I don't you know. Push it. Push it. Push it. Push it. Thank you for your talk. I really love the project. Uh, Thank It's amazing. And I, I wanted to ask, does it work only uh, with Android or is, uh, on, also for iPhone? <laughs> no, it works only for, for, for Android because Apple has like a lot of protections. 
I mm-hmm. have to, yeah. So it's, it's unfortunately that, well, unfortunately, or uh, yeah, it's it's not possible. You need like an Apple device. I could make like some sort of program that would work in mm-hmm. your in your computer. It's possible to control, but not to make it in a device that is small and you're able to replicate mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and when you connect your phone, for instance, uh, do you have to kind of give the access to to your data or to your system, or how, how does it work? I mean, or you just have to connect it and it works? Uh, well, you have to connect it, but first you have uh, so another computer is allowed to use your mobile phone. You, mm-hmm. you need to to give like developer access to it, mm-hmm. but it, you know it's like pretty. It is more the worst. Pretty, pretty yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's 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 my super part. Yeah. Well, I also really like the idea that, about this putting of geolocation. This is cool. Yeah, I think that that's also very interesting. There has been like some pro- projects also more in the physical, uh, in the physical. But I really, I really. Basically, it's like working in the in the idea of adding noise to your interactions, whatever in in whatever layer it is. And this one that you know the the, the three last slides were like that is like something new that I've been thinking about how breaking images just that just human can enjoy them, no? And uh, you know, so you know, it's like. Uh, since I had like this residency and do, do this pandemic, I, I did I couldn't do you know work in the physical space. I've been thinking a lot and like trying, like, but I hope that, that maybe in the future I will be able to develop all this probably remote. But yeah. Yes, Lev, please turn turn the microphone on. Uh, Lev, Lev, we don't hear you. Can you turn? Yes, now we do. So, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, well done projects um, but to me like it sounded like like artist talk you know like when you know artists apply for a job so he shows his <laughs> projects and um, I was wondering if you have some larger message uh, which will kind of has some connection to perhaps ironic perhaps serious but interesting kind of theme of uh, our whole event like what is the connection well, I think that nowadays that we are, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree that it's like an, an art story because it's like the, the sort of thing. I think uh, I chose this project that talks about um, about the surveillance and how we are being how we are being controlled constantly, even though that we are like, in our place. And I think it's very connected to the current situation. So that's why this is like the project. The project I brought to talk to talk about today. So, yeah, basically the connection, the link would be like surveillance. It's like I want, you know, I do all these projects to try to to make people conscious about this topic, uh, and it's like it's it's like a new line of project that I've been like doing like barely like a year or less 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 than a year. But yeah, it would be surveillance. The answer. Yeah. Just, just, uh, just very quickly, just to follow up a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea of surveillance, you know, it has many kind of different, right? We different ways to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But in fact, what we see today is that uh, you know, the countries, right? The Asian countries, which are kind of more modern and at the same time more collective, right? I'm now in Korea, you know, where uh, I think people look at this more realistically uh, or just different, right? So we say, okay, so I arrive in Korea, we put two apps on my phone. I have to check you know, every every day. They follow me. Uh, once we thought I went outside, I was just on my balcony, it was kind of funny. But people accept, right? People accept this um, constraint. What in the Western world will think constraints. Uh, we passed a law in 2015. And you know, people, you know, the society accepts these constraints because we see that the result is uh, in a very, very small right, rate of you know, uh, cases. Um, and Korea, you know, in some ways, it's a very democratic society. You probably know a few years ago, two million Koreans demonstrating every Saturday, and the president was displaced, something which never never happens in America, for example. It doesn't even happen in Europe. So on the one hand, right, it's a very progressive, you know, it's a very kind of Western democratic society, and yet, you know, I think we don't think of surveillance in this kind of, you know, almost like a binary way. I'm not saying yeah. you, but 
you know, it's bad. No, no, no. It's a question of, it's a question of context, right? You know, and yeah. what's interesting is, you know, Western societies first we said we're not going to do anything. Don't wear a mask. And eventually we said we actually have no ideas. We're just going to copy what Karin's done. We'll do contact tracing, right? We'll do mask. So the question is, you know, how can we think about surveillance? Um, you know, how can we start ourselves, but also teach our audiences to think about surveillance, perhaps, you know, in a bit more complex way? No? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree that it's much more complex uh, as you brought the idea of Korea more, and now the, su the surveillance. It's more complex, but it may be more, depends on the situation, right? So some situations yeah. that can be, you know, like, for example, well, surveillance is also a very positive term in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, biology and medical science. By surveillance, we simply mean basically following virus, like for figuring out how many people are sick. So, so I think, you know, so how do we kind of, how do we approach it? You yeah. know, so it doesn't become like this on-off thing. Absolutely. Uh, for me, and I mentioned in the first slide, for me, what is interesting and the, my, the point that I am against very clearly, it's about the idea mm -hmm. of extracting value of people being able to monetize personal interactions. For me, that is the point. That is like my line of work. Um, for example, as you said, I was like working with this idea of uh, geolocation, spoofing and also adding, adding noise there. But with the problem that we are currently that in some way being surveilled would bring like something positive to us like society makes the, the topic much more complex. And I, I'm using complex because you have to give freedom and there's like a, like a huge debate. For me, my line of work is more related with economics and surveillance. I don't know if, yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, it's super relevant because I'm also interested in AI uh, capitalism, surveillance capitalism, and also in digital control society, which is common here in Russia. And so, and I'm also working on some projects in this area. So I think this is super relevant uh, topic to our conference hmm. uh, because every uh, everyone is trying just trying to do something in the area he's in, or she interested in. So it's it's uh, I think it's obvious to me. <laughs> why why are you talking about this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> About your project. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this conversation. Uh, I I personally uh, loved uh, that you approached uh, the uh, like sort of not very uh, known to a broad public uh, fact uh, that there are very different layers of on which inf information is stored and interpreted, and that on the screen layer uh, this the image okay. is for for us but uh, not on the layers of uh, storing it uh, yeah. or uh, on uh, like the cloud layer and uh, it's not that obvious that uh, on the screen we have the freedom to have the image on the for us and this is an interesting thing so uh, do we have our next uh, and I also want to remind uh, our viewers of Russian simultaneous translation at contact that you can also to ask questions and comments so please do so and we will ask uh, we will ask the speakers and uh, thanks martin for your talk and, thank uh, you, could you thank you uh, for giving good. us the chance and to show like the latest work and good luck for all the viewers ciao Liana, Liana, will you introduce our next speaker yes, and our next speaker is irini narana profedimitrio irini hi hi hello <laughs> Can I'm you ready. hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, great. great. You can start with your talk. Great. Thank you for so much for having me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, similarly to uh, Lev, I was kind of um, a bit, yeah, I was a bit unsure about how to, you know, what to talk about and how to approach it. I mean, it's something that I found also quite, uh, like uh, some time ago at Future Everything, we launched a program called Future uh, Focus, and that's how I named this, uh, this, this talk. And it's pretty much about like thinking about crisis, not just the current crisis, but ongoing uh, kind of crisis that, and challenges that we've been facing. But um, I just, um, I'm just going to share my screen just to, to share a few, um, uh, a few slides. If, if that's okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, can you, oops, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so so I've been interested in, in like architecture of systems and, um, and how we 
how these are constructed, but also interrogating like who controls these systems and whose lives are kind of uh, implicated and who is excluded, etc. And I just thought to use that as a kind of parallel to what is happening right now. And um, the, this is just uh, something that I've been uh, using quite a lot as uh, thinking and inspiration. It's the anatomy of an AI system by Kate Crawford and uh, Vladan Yoler. And um, I had the chance to, to work with them um, for an exhibition at the VNA in 2018. Uh, but it's really uh, what I found really interesting is this exploration of architectures of um, surrounding AI systems and like environments and uh, exploitation. Um, uh, and of course, extraction as well. And um, in this case, um, of course, they are talking about Amazon Alexa, but of course, uh, I'm thinking of it uh, as Alexa, as a disembodied uh, part of a larger body of a network of these systems. And of course, the way uh, what, what um, this map shows is the birth, the life and the death of this system. And of course, the, the the term itself, artificial intelligence, is very problematic, of course, because it implies that these systems are automatic when we know they're not, and also it that makes that that makes it easy to remove accountability and um, uh, from the agents that are behind these systems when we know that they contain error and biases, etc. So. Um, so, so yes, I've been thinking about how, uh, like, we um, we use in our society. We ended up in a, in a way that uh, algorithms uh, algorithms have become elemental bricks in a way to for building um, not just uh, AI, in, uh, but also uh, reorganizing many parts of how we think about a society. And uh, since these uh, have been adopted across so many different areas, and um, and of course, how we um, through like we use technologies to kind of monitor, classify, quantify, commodify, and financialize like so many aspects of of society. And um, uh, oops, sorry, I'm just going to go to another slide. So so yeah, so in, in a way, I feel that the work that uh, these people, like researchers and artists, do, like from of course um, AI Now Institute and Katie Crawford and uh, Vladen Yoler at Novi Sad University, but also Joy Bolamini uh, with the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, and who is talking a lot about racial injustice as well, but also tactical tech with uh, Glassroom and Data Detox, data feminist groups, etc. Um, but also, I've been thinking a little bit of kind of you know, the history and also the deconstruction of this and how we can, how this makes kind of everything relevant and connected. So, so this, um, this Amazon patent, uh, which was filed in 2016, was also unearthed by uh, Kate and Vladan in their uh, map uh, of work. And um, it's, it, it hasn't, it, it wasn't kind of, um, it was filed as a patent, but never constructed or used. And of course, it's a metal cage for uh, the worker um, in, in the fulfillment, like a warehouse. And um, it is equipped with different uh, add-ons, cybernetic add-ons. That means that the worker can move through the warehouse with by the same motorized system that uh, sifts the selves and uh, that are filled with the merchandise. And it's uh, it's really interesting because it kind of reduces the human, the worker into uh, like a part of this machine body. And uh, it, it kind of uh, makes me think also, of course, history, uh, like, and, you know, the uh, the mechanical Turk, the chess automaton by von Kempelen in 1770. And the reason why I find uh, interesting the link with the past is that a lot of the things that, we have uh, today, of course, um, happened because of decisions that were taken in the past by specific people. And uh, it kind of, it's, I think it's a good reminder to think of from like history, but also when we talk about the, the future in terms of decisions that we make now and what the uh, next generations are going to find uh, in a way. Um, and it's really, and again, like to go back to the uh, to the idea of like the hidden worker. It's kind of, uh, it, of course, we all know about the the, the the click workers and every and everything that is uh, everyone who's in behind the scenes of what we we see. And uh, it's it's interesting that the service workers that animate the machine are obscured by 
the whole spectacle of the machine. Of, and of course, it's really an interesting discussion about care and maintenance of the systems, which is kind of parallel to what is, has been happening with, um, with this crisis as well. And uh, who is taking, looking after us, why we are, we are at home working and when people have to carry on uh, continuing with things uh, that to keep the society going. Um, it's actually really interesting that uh, the history of policing, in, at least in the UK, it starts from the need to monitor the workers' bodies. And that was in the uh, 1798 when the Marine uh, Police Office was formed in the London docks uh, because to, to monitor the, work, the workers at the docks who would uh, take uh, before that like leftover material, for example, wood, etc., uh, that were transported for their own use. And of course, the owners at some point thought that this was theft. And rather than, you know, just uh, the workers taking a share of their kind of labor, and they wanted to, say, to stop that. So that's how they uh, kind of put together the Marine uh, Police Office to, uh, to, mo to, to track uh, the workers. Um, and I also wanted to share this uh, kind of by Anna Riedler, this mosaic virus, which is another reminder, at least for me, of, the, uh, of this kind of hidden uh, labor behind the systems and uh, the training. Uh, this is a training data set that she used for uh, like an AI generated film called Mosaic Virus. And she, um, she took the photos herself, uh, like tens of thousands, and then she uh, manually uh, tagged them and categor categorized them. And it's, of course, a reminder of the um, exploited, uh, outsourced, usually uh, uh, workers uh, in behind labeling these um, data sets. Um, and to kind of uh, paraphrase a little now, like, uh, yeah, to paraphrase Trevor, Trevor uh, Paglen, um, when he's talk talking about when we create taxonomies, and there is, of course, a politics to it, but um, we also create a negative uh, space within, um, within these taxonomies, and uh, these negative spaces where, where the things, are, like the things that are outside of that. So, of course, all these systems that we create, it means that we have, we create realities and conformity states that, uh, of course, we need to uh, interrogate and ask ourselves like who is left outside of these processes and um, and of course with uh, the current situation we've been kind of um, yeah like uh, experiencing like an accentuating kind of um, uh, yeah accentuation of like surveillance but also uh, the, the the class we have seen also uh, the injustice and kind of uh, yeah like the inequalities that uh, are happening and again I'll go back to history and uh, from uh, talking about um, yeah classification and in this case you know with uh, how um, syst systems like to classify people were used from ancient Greece for example with physiognomics but also in the Middle uh, Ages and Renaissance, but also more recently in the 19th century with uh, criminologists like Cesare Lombroso and Alphonse Bertillon. And um, what we are creating is kind of like we're bringing back, we are creating uh, like systems that bring back these uh, ideas that we had kind of um, rejected because all of these are based on, uh, rely on racist uh, stereotypes. Um, I don't know if if I'm running over time. Just let me know. Uh, but yeah, this is just something that Caroline Sinders put together, which was exploring um, emotional emotional recognition, and she created uh, a, a set of rules to help you uh, manipulate your facial uh, kind of uh, yeah your facial kind of um, uh, yeah movements, so that you so that um, your um, emotions are not recognized by, by machine uh, learning, uh, by machine systems, yeah. And um, so, so yeah, so as I've just been thinking that as we are going through like now uh, this crisis and trying to get out of it in a way, but of course there are more crises unfolding at the same time, um, we kind of, um, in a way we can, we might see that how, uh, all these spaces might get 
like our moving spaces from our homes, from our bodies might be kind of read and uh, interpreted and in, in different ways. And, but also how like this, um, you know, just how all our public spaces are being transformed, for example, under the banner of like public health, of course, with um, like patrolling, like drones and thermal cameras, etc. And um, so, so yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering like how, um, you know, are beyond extractivism, uh, the vulnerable bodies, homeless, elderly, disabled, prisoners, etc., regarded or valued from now on, and um, and the need, of course, for us to uh, maybe through art or like at least that's my kind of you know way of dealing with things, but to um, interrogate, but also to stay, to try and uh, stay focused and uh, and um, and understand like how the use of fear, misinformation, consumerism, etc., are being used as a distraction tools uh, in a way from to take us away from the real causes that uh, create all this crisis. And I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and finish here. Oops. Sorry, I don't know how to stop. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Oops, uh, sorry. Elena, do you want to join us? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, surprisingly, showed all my favorites, so favorite favorite projects. <laughs> uh, Anatomy of AI systems is is, uh, is really great. Like uh, one of my favorite projects ever. Sorry, can I just check? I'm not still sharing my screen. You can see I'm back. <laughs> no, no, I can. Okay. Sorry. No, we, we, we see you all. We see you all good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's fine. Uh, well, uh, I actually, uh, well, I'm also going to develop some project against uh, uh, civilians, but well, actually, I'm always thinking, what can we do as uh, cultural workers? I mean, well, it, it, it doesn't, um, well, um, it makes no sense just to, uh, if, if we can just uh, talk, I don't know, maybe we can do something also. Well, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, th this is why I wanted, yeah, I mentioned before, like, um, like artists who work, you know, who just join forces with like uh, researchers, but also like, uh, you know, just trying to, to, to explore different frameworks that we can, and different systems that we could, I mean, to be, I, I don't know, maybe I'm being too negative, but I don't, I don't know if there will be like a perfect kind of, you know, uh, system ever, but I think there is always, uh, you know, they, it's, it's always difficult, like to, to go through, like to fight through these controls and like who is kind of, um, uh, yeah, leading on all these, but I think there is a lot of work definitely to be done. Um, for example, you were saying that you are doing a hackathon and like you're just bringing some people together to, to think about different alternative tools. Uh, but also like uh, this is something that I've been asking myself all the time and especially now, like for example, a few days ago we had a talk um, and it happened like during the time when everybody was putting, uh, you know, just canceling events because of the, um, the brutal kind of uh, violence against black people that is happening right now. And we were thinking like, if we should maybe cancel the, you know, not talk about, you know, just cancel the event and not do anything as in solidarity. But then we, instead of doing that, we just put a talk together, like bringing voices and just uh, like, you know, just making sure that we're not silent, that we just, um, we actually have a conversation about that. And I think this is quite important that we do have conversations, but also this is like maybe a starting point and then to help us come together and maybe explore like different ways of doing things. Um, talk about ethics, talk about maybe alternative, like the need of legal frameworks that we don't have for all of this right now as well. So, uh, yeah. So for example, I don't know, for like um, surveillance and like data tracking and all this stuff, like we know that, you know, the you could be like, you could be covered, like you would need like a police, somebody would need a warranty to come in to your house and search and everything, but this doesn't exist, for example, for our, uh, you know, digital <laughs> kind of self, right? I mean, people can snoop and just steal our, you know, just use our data, etc. 
And it's the same with the platforms that we're using, like um, Zoom, for example. I'm using Zoom for my events, but it's, it is problematic. And I think we need to discuss that. We need to challenge these systems and tools that we're using. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to mention first that uh, you told uh, not being silent is important, and it's totally true. Uh, because we all witnessed, this, especially like here in Russia, that we just don't have, uh, many people don't have the basic knowledge on this line. And uh, like as I saw someone uh, posting uh, from the United States on social network, already learning about uh, like racism is already a privilege uh, compared to experiencing it all, all your life. And uh, in Russia, a lot of people just cannot uh, completely uh, empathize or understand what it is because we don't have this much of these examples in front of our eyes and uh, people cannot link it to racism against our uh, Asian immigrants and it's a big problem I would say uh, people sometimes just don't get the thing and it's very sad so we have to uh, speak and uh, don't be silent and uh, explain and communicate to people it's very important uh, also about zoom yeah they recently just released uh, that they are not going to uh, encrypt uh, free uh, zoom calls because they collaborate with the uh, federal services <laughs> which is really uh, ugly and weird but uh, i have some uh, people and one of our uh, speakers uh, from our first conference Ksenia Yermoshina she works uh, together and helps uh, to test a team of uh, work uh, from Germany working on open source uh, uh, conferencing tool named uh, uh, Accelerator. It's pretty decent and good. They are now rebuilding it from scratch and we are going to use it for our further conferences. So I have a lot of expectations on that line as well. And thanks you, thank you for your talk. Uh, ah, one more thing. Uh, I just thought we are going to uh, do, and uh, this re relates to Lena's question uh, of we can do something ourselves as an artist, and we are going to uh, uh, start a, a lab uh, of uh, using Instagram uh, masks and filters as art activi activist tool. And I thought that maybe, like, not now, just maybe if you have this thought, maybe you as a creative director of Future Everything, maybe you have someone on your mind who you can recommend to us as a mentor, as an expert, who can help uh, people work on buildings, uh, Instagram masks and effects, not like fun thing, but as an art activism, if some thoughts will come to you, we will be very thankful. Yeah, definitely, that's great. Also, another thing that I forgot to say was that uh, I think that just or arts organizations as well, and especially arts organizations that get public funding, which is what we do partially, not, not always, but I think we have a responsibility as well to engage with different sectors and uh, bring up issues like that. So for example, at Future Everything, we try to work as much as possible with and engage with uh, local authorities, with, uh, with government, but also with the tech industry and trying to enable conversations and critical conversations to happen and explore like where the issues are and how we could do things differently. Because also the, the thing is that I found in the art world sometimes I, in, in the past, I, I was quite disconnected. It's very easy to get in kind of bubbles as well and mm -hmm. not to, and I think it's important to have um, cross-sector dialogue. Otherwise, it means that we do, we have these conversations between us, but then do they ever reach like the people that they need to be reaching and so they can understand like that maybe this is not working or maybe this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a racist tool or it's like, a, you know, it's, it's uh, it's not it's it's wrong for in this for this reason or the other, so I think that's important as well. Well, that's yes. great that we have these kind of conversations. So, and totally. I hope so someday we will also have this kind of conversation in Russia. I mean, between authorities and artists, and like yeah, would be. Good. Oh, it's not. It doesn't. It's not to say that they are all kind of going somewhere ideally or that something happens. But I think it's it's important to even start conversations like that. <laughs> so thanks again for your talk, and Lena, maybe you could uh, introduce our next guest. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being us. And um, our next guest is uh, Olga Bat. 
Olga, are you here? Uh, hi. Uh, you can see Hello. Do you hear me well? Yes, yes. Good. Super, super. Okay. Um, thank you, Elena. And uh, thank you, Ildar. Uh, for this kind invitation and I would say uh, a rare opportunity to join uh, such a nice company of um, world saviors. Um, I will start my talk, talk uh, with a short introduction uh, because I think, well, that will lead to uh, explaining my, um, I would say, curatorial approach and position um, a bit and uh, that would lead to the uh, you know main topic of my speech today which is darkness and how to you know work with it um so uh the last uh, few years um uh, actually like five years i've been working um in the polytechnic museum uh which is a science uh, museum in moscow in the uh, well now in the very long period of reconstruction uh, but among other things uh, in Polytechnic Museum I was uh, responsible for the Polytech Festival of Art Science and Technology and uh, like last the last year uh, year I was its uh, program director and uh, so like long story short it's a huge huge uh, event uh, it was a huge event now uh, it's postponed for the next i don't know how many years um so uh, it was a huge event aimed at um common audience uh, and uh, that uh, was held in uh, huge Moscow parks uh, with a capacity of uh, more than uh, 100,000 uh, 100, visitors. So actually what were we doing? We were uh, like in a, um, quoting uh, one very popular curator, we were really uh, mixing very different worlds. Uh, so the world of uh, international art and science uh, scene and uh, actually the uh, I would say quite family audience. Um, and uh, um, so, and what basis uh, that we found was common for both of these, uh, you know, very different worlds were the basis of curiosity and uh, critical thinking. Uh, so I, last year I uh, left uh, the Polytechnic Museum and together with my with a few of my friends and former colleagues, uh, we decided to, that it, it is time to, you know, create our own uh, institution in a way uh, with our own, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it miss missions, but with our own values and our own approach. And we um, started a curatorial agency, which is called NADA. Uh, and uh, so, this agency, which is, I think is quite uh, unique in a way in our field, we, we mix our uh, expertise in art and science scene and trends. Uh, our, you know, big experience in science communication that we were uh, developing through um, our work in the Polytechnic. Uh, huge experience in exhibition making and on a museum level and which is also very unique in experience in management and programming uh, of a really large scale events. So um, most of the last years uh, I spent uh, trying, uh, so my, my working agenda was uh, mostly connected uh, with explaining uh, like difficult things and complicated things in a clear and short way. So it was mostly what I did. So uh, was it, you know, defending art projects in the center of a science museum or, uh, you know, explaining uh, high quality uh, digital and art and science projects of uh, maybe high complicity uh, for a common audience? 
or you know recruiting scientists to collaborate in things that they don't usually uh, do in their everyday life uh, or selling concepts and visions to sponsors and clients so um, this principle of explan explanatory i would say uh, behavior uh, went deep into my uh, curatorial practice practice so for me, it's really essential to make people uh, understand what I'm doing uh, or what artists uh, whom I represent are doing. And um, most of these concepts and visions um, were, that I'm working with uh, are built around technologies, both you know old and new. And um, there is this common understanding, I think that we all share it, uh, that new technologies, they don't only complement our capabilities or expanding the capabilities of our body and might, mind, but also shape um, and give them direction. So um, we are embedded in uh, technological system, systems and uh, they determine how we act and how we think. Uh, and it is very difficult to look at them from the distance and think uh, in other terms. So um, another example from my uh, work in the Polytechnic, um, I was um, like the last year that I was working there, I was uh, working on the strategy um, of how to, uh, to work with our art pro project in the um, context of um, in the context of a science museum which is not you know obvious uh, and um, first of all first of all it is not obvious because art uh, doesn't uh, isn't applicable to the principles of reliability uh, and, ac and accessibility that are very essential to uh, to, science, to, to the work of uh, a science museum. Uh, that, that's main aim is to explain um, scientific concepts in a short and clear way to a, a common audience. Uh, but still, uh, even though, you know, it's uh, not uh, very, you know, um, ap applicable from the first, side uh, there was still an agenda uh, there was still a, an idea that uh, the politics should uh, include uh, arts and sciences in its agenda and uh, the main argument uh, for that was that actually art and science field uh, or art and science practice yeah, practice is a better word uh, is um, a tool uh, to mark and um, distinguish uh, boundaries and uh, limitations of scientific knowledge. And uh, then in, even, um, I mean, based on this idea, we developed a, a guideline how to write, for example, texts on art and science projects, because it's very, it's always very complicated matter. And as you know, uh, as a person who uh, usually has to, uh, you know, present uh, these kinds of idea to people who, who may hear about art and science for the first time, it's really a very um, common comment that uh, um, texts on art and science projects are very, I would say, vermitable. So we really made a, a, a guideline uh, uh, in order to make uh, it's a, uh, to, to make it as a clear tool. So um, what I'm talking about that actually, so working in the field of art and science gives us a great uh, privilege. So the positions on the border of uh, two or more quite opposite, opposite disciplines gives us a unique tool to actually find uh, and even poke borders of scientific knowledge and uh, 
of our you know te technological reality and to uh, make this uh, step on the outside an opportunity to look from the from the side on this um, uh, you know technology that we are dealing with and uh, because in most of the times uh, technology is darkness and so we don't don't understand what we are facing how it is working and uh, what is it what is it bringing and who are responsible for for the technology and who profits of it and uh, it's not only like new technology is, is darkness oh uh, for example like our team is now uh, <clears throat> working uh, on, on an exhibition uh, about uh, the history of Moscow industry. Um, it, the exhibition will open uh, in September at the Museum of Moscow. And uh, <clears throat> so we are telling the story, we're trying to find, you know, metaphors for, uh, a huge, huge range of uh, comp industrial companies and what they do, and explaining their technologies, and to avoid, you know, this uh, cargo cult, which is very common um, in uh, in industry exhibitions and history exhibitions. So, uh, so if uh, the technology is darkness. And uh, if uh, the, salva the salvation, because uh, we are talking in this conference in this term of saving the world. So if the salvation is thinking about technology, it's thinking about science, thinking about cultural and social context, uh, maybe not quite always understanding, but thinking about it, um, how can we use our skills uh, in uh, building this critical approach to technology to a broader audience, uh, how to step out of this darkness. So um, what I'm talking about is that uh, the art and science community has a, a big op opportunity now to step out in the current crisis and uh, use the um, broader platforms and uh, and to speak to a broader audience, which is, for example, um, the conference that uh, Helena and Ilda are organizing, which yesterday had like 40, 54,000, if I'm not, uh, if, I, if I'm right, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, visitors. So um, uh, I called this uh, my talk, like darkness, place for freedom, possibility, and equality. And uh, by that, I mean that uh, we have a freedom of research, uh, a possibility to educate, and an opportunity uh, to bring equality and understanding of our techno society uh, using the existing potential of the art and science community and of its uh, current, you know, very developed skills of uh, building a critical, uh, critical approach, critical thinking, uh, and uh, sharing this with a broader audience. I think that's the best moment now to act. Thanks for your talk, Olga. And Thank let's you. now go to the round table format. Uh, if anyone is willing to join, please turn your cameras. Mm, thank you so much. I can probably ask uh, a question that I was thinking of uh, as, as you were talking. We've never met in person, so now uh, I've heard a lot about you, but we've never met in person. So, pleasure to meet you, and thanks to Elena. <laughs> So I was thinking what, what you were talking about, about this political agenda of art and science and um, the mm -hmm. fact that we are constantly criticized for not um, having uh, this political agenda in some of the cases. I was uh, thinking that 
probably the origins of, of this situation of not having political agenda, they might lie in the history of technology, which is connected with the military industrial complex in the beginning, right? If we talk about 20th century, 20th century, and then if we talk about uh, this digital revolution and post-digital revolution, that would be the huge corporations, which are even less, you know, uh, well, probably not less attractive than military industrial complex, but, you know, at the same level. So I was thinking, uh, what kind of dissociations we can create uh, from this to build from corporations? Um, we separate ourselves from from these associations. What do you think? So, do you think it's through educational practices, or you have any other groundbreaking ideas? Well, um, I don't, of course, have uh, groundbreaking ideas <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, let me think. Well, uh, how we can? There, I think there was. Uh, um, I don't know. There is uh, uh, this nice. Well, not nice, but very interesting uh, author James. Uh, Bridal or James Bridal, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I uh, heard his uh, uh, interview with um, uh, Daniel Vasiliev, or was it like a postcast where Daniel Vasiliev was participating? And sorry, I, I, I don't understand it clear. Uh, but uh, there was a nice, um, so he was uh, uh, speaking about the metaphor of cloud. So, uh, mm -hmm. how we use, how we call this cloud services. So of course we use this called cloud services, but actually it's a very bad metaphor uh, because it's, uh, you know, it tricks us uh, into think, think, thinking that uh, cloud technology is something that is doesn't leave any trace, that it uh, doesn't have any, you know, huge uh, resources or it uh, probably does, well, so that it's something like which that it's something out there uh, that doesn't have a, quite a big impact on us. Uh, while uh, on the contrary, um, the, it's very powerful industry, and most of the money now are in the IT uh, business. Uh, so uh, well, one of the tools is uh, I don't know like working with such metaphors, uh, for example, uh, you know, rethinking uh, the, uh, the existing me metaphors, for example, like that uh, brain, is, so how, for example, uh, brain is, uh, and brain activity is now very often explained as a computer, uh, the computer machine is a computer so actually this you know like false metaphors and working with them is one of the um, you know big issues in the science communications communication because uh usually some uh, science communication and uh, what actually makes science communicators very popular is using uh, metaphors that give the false understanding of the things they actually don't uh, you know, explain anything, mm -hmm. uh, which is the same like a cloud, uh, uh, giving us the vision that IT industry is uh, something that is far, far, far away. So, yeah, like build, building new metaphors and, uh, you know, working and digging deep in the metaphors that already exist, I think it's one of the tools that can help, you know, to mm -hmm. with this project process, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning clouds. We, we constantly use them. I never realized that, that they're not neutral. They're such a beautiful metaphor, but it definitely needs to be despoken. It needs to be unfolded, deciphered. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
som som inte behövs. <laughs> Actually, I think we can uh, maybe Natasha, are are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm ready. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to announce the theme of uh, this year festival, one on one festival that I've uh, been curated together with a wonderful team and that both uh, Lena and Eldar were parts of. Uh, uh, so this year's theme, uh, theme uh, had to change. Uh, so initially we were thinking of talking about... Sorry, what's happening? I guess there is some other noise. It's fine. Uh, we have some troubles uh, with connection. But we need good. Evgeny. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, initially we were thinking to talk about uh, the uh, robot manipulators and the way um, and more broadly about how the machines are manipulating people, but then everything changed and we formulated a theme which is all in one, meaning that we suddenly are all uh, in the same situation, but yet in a different spaces. And thus we probably need to think of, um, of a mutual language uh, to, to speak about this. So um, we've made a little video uh, which is an open call to the festival so this is probably addressed to a um, wider community of artists that that are watching us so i'm going to show the video and then probably explain some of the things that that uh, this video is talking about okay Hopefully I'm sharing the video. Something happening with the sound. This is definitely the end of the global world as we know it. We possibly have never been completely free in our movement, but this movement was the basis of our activity. The information technologies that used to sustain, survey, and separate us, now connect and coordinate. Still remaining to be the part of the global information capitalism. Free movement in the, in the moment is only available to goods and machines. The only available instance of freedom at this point is the telepresence and thus Oh, we dedicate the festival to this instance. All in one is the theme, and all in one means that all of us find ourselves in um, almost the same situation. So we would like to uh, investigate what can be sent safely of a distance. Is it the texture of the voice? Is it the warmth of the gaze? Can we also send of a distance smell? Is it possible to receive touch? Uh, what can change one's sensual ecosphere at a distance? Telehaptics, touch, at a distance becomes our central theme. Possibly internet now has become the post-internet we never knew of. Does this mean that the new limitations will be implemented or telepresence will remain uncensored and only surveyed? 
what can be safely included in it? How comfortable does education feel in Zoom? How uh, open it is for the artistic practices? Before the pandemic, we wanted to dedicate the festival to the way machines manipulate the world. Now it has become clear that this ethical optics needs to be recalibrated. And what is to be understood at this point is what connects the people except the communication machines and which of these connections will survive the pandemic. The development of artificial intelligence suggests the next stage of evolution of technology, which is the reproduction of the machines without the assistance of the humans. So it can possibly be the world of machines for the machines in which the role of humans needs to be redefined. Will the universities of the future teach not to work? Will the communication between the individuals be equal to the table of modicons, which is valuable in the same degree to machines? humans and animals? Is it possible in the structure of surveillance capitalism even to think of an individual? Or uh, is it right to talk about Tividu, part of the personality which will be safely stored at the remote servers? Telepresence and its possibility is a unique experience that we are about to abandon now. But this experience will remain in our mutual history of senses and history of boredom, history of work and history of leisure. We would like to fix this changing conditions and understand their properties. It is clear that teleoptics remains the possibility of the future relationships between people. We invite artists, philosophers and engineers to contemplate on this experience together with us. So we do invite artists, philosophers, and engineers to contemplate on this experience with us. And how we actually uh, invite them to do this is uh, through, uh, through the open call that we've just, um, we've just issued. And actually, um, this day is the, I think I need to quit the video first, sorry. Uh -huh. Sharing something else. Okay. Am I, sh am I sharing the website at the moment? Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, we do see that. Great. Uh, so yes. um, there is not too much uh, detail um, at the website at the moment. Just I guess I, I take a pleasure of uh, announcing its existence. Its existence. So what um, what we were thinking of, and we were thinking of doing this on the twentieth to twenty first twenty um, first of June. Uh, is a series of uh, artist talks and a little gallery of digital artwork. Um, and the um, inspiration for this was actually this, this event. So again, I'd like to thank um, Elena El uh, and Eldar enormously for, for having this energy. Because actually before, before this event, before this um, invitation, I was experiencing very long-term three months apathy, not believing in the meaning of art any longer. So, um, Personally, for me, this this is the moment of uh, manifestation of uh, trust in um, in art and its um, its 
uh, ability to, uh, without directly touching the reality, enhance the theme telepresence without directly touching the reality necessarily or with directly touching the reality to bring some kind of emotional change. So let me speak a little bit more about uh, about the themes that, um, that were mentioned uh, in the video that probably were not that clear. So we were thinking of, uh, of this um, of this contradiction between the uh, inward uh, condition that we are all in this small capsules of our homes uh, in a way um, this can be compared to the condition of uh, coming back to the to the womb and uh, on the other hand there is this uh, radical intrusion that is happening which is uh, uh we are in in this in this rooms and the cells and these wombs we are uh, allowing all the world to uh, to watch us to survey us um and uh what i was also noticing over this three months that um I've, uh, i haven't met uh very many people in person, and yet um, there were events in my life. There were feelings that I had. There were thoughts that um, that um, that I was sensing. And so we were thinking, what is it that uh, has changed in the human nature over this uh, three months? So what is it that now we learned to send over the distance? And tele means uh, distance. So. Telehaptics uh, is this, on one hand, uh, ideal way of being present in the situation of isolation, being able to sense, touch uh, at a distance. On the other hand, uh, it uh, creates a new uh, haunting possibilities for, uh, for surveillance. So someone can touch you without your, uh, your even knowing this or um, it can be uh, someone touching you who is not this person who is saying that uh, is touching you. So uh, this new uh, sensuality, this new affective infrastructure is something that, that we want to investigate and we invite artists to investigate. So um, the festival will have this series of online events uh, on the 20th and 21st of June. And hopefully in September, we will launch uh, the new page of um, history of the festival, which will be connected with um, its more art and science center, uh, where there will be opened a new exhibition space and where uh, we hope to do what we initially planned to do an um, exhibition engaging with uh, the uh, robots manipulators and hence the uh, robot manipulator that you were seeing at, um, at the back um, at the background uh, in the video. One of them is uh, Gokachu, the artist robot that um, that is almost completely independent. It is based uh, also in Itmo. And um, one of the aims of this robot is to be completely independent and this independence is in a way is achieved by uh, selling um, some of these paintings that, that the robot is making. So um, that's uh, about it. Uh, this is all I wanted to announce and I'm happy to start answering questions if you have any. Yeah, you can also uh, stop sharing. So you yeah. did already. Thank you for your talk. It sounds super yeah. interesting. Uh, so basically, you're going to to do the physical uh, exhibition in physical space in uh, in autumn, right? Is yeah, that... we, we uh, will do the exhibition, and so we plan to open this space in September, mm. unless I don't know something unexpected happens. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so suddenly. Uh, festival spreads um, not only in space but also in time, so it will have the June iteration um, mm -hmm. and it will have the autumn iteration. Mm -hmm. And in also, June, uh, also there will be some online exhibition. 
right? Yeah, we are thinking of the form of. So um, I just finished doing the um, projects of uh, my students at the small college of liberal arts and sciences, and we created a virtual gallery. And uh, first, I was very skeptical about this. Extremely skeptical. Virtual gallery. Uh, we need another virtual gallery. And uh, then suddenly we realized uh, all the crazy opportunities that this virtual gallery includes. And Malena's work is also in this virtual gallery. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, your work is there. You, you should check it out. So I'll, I'll probably, I can actually share the screen and show you the website. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge one. It's usually uh, what, what it does. Um, when I uh, show it in Zoom, it, it makes my image very pixelated, <laughs> very crazy. But I'm, I mean, I, I can still do this. Um, yeah, so first I was skeptical, and then suddenly I got uh, extremely uh, inspired about this. As usual, constraint becomes uh, an, an uh, drive force for invention. So. Um, yeah, uh, let me show you. Uh, Lens Are you going to do a screen sharing because we need to prepare that? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm going to since I started talking about it. Okay. Okay. Do that, and meanwhile, I will uh, ask Olga. We have a question from online. Uh, mm -hmm. So people ask, uh, where uh, can they learn about your uh, coming projects? Uh, where can they see your upcoming projects? Uh, so, um, well, we have a couple of pro projects that are cooking. So, uh, one of the projects will be a big exhibition in the Museum of Moscow, uh, starting uh, on the 23rd of September. So, it will be uh, an exhibition about uh, the history of in Moscow industry, and uh, the exhibition title will be will be uh the symphony of sirens uh history pro of moscow industry from the 19th century to the present uh where uh people can find it well we were working on our website but uh it will definitely be on my facebook so if you want to to can get the uh, updates you can just you know also find, we <laughs> Uh, also, we, we usually uh, add all the links uh, to our speakers' ah. websites and information to our streams and add navigation. Mm -hmm. So if you send us, we will update our YouTube channel with links to your project. That will be super cool. Ah, and also, I, I, cool see, I also <laughs> see that we have our next guest and it's time for her talk. So let uh, Natalia, this is your screen, right? So tell us about it and then I will ask Lena to introduce our next guest. Oh, yep, uh, so uh, this is uh, the project which is called Fragile Media and it is a fully uh, virtual exhibition space that uh, contains uh, Liana talking about how her image is going to be destroyed and finally I know that my image is now being destroyed so I thought that oh, it's, uh, it looks good mm -hmm. Yeah, I told you it's, uh, it's good Alright, so I'll <laughs> right here uh, self uh, dissolving into pixels <laughs> I'm oh. just my screen share ah, I just stopped my screen share okay and that's actually that was actually some true uh, pixel bending uh, yeah <laughs> nice yes. so uh, so thank you thank you for your talk and now let's uh, invite Daya uh, uh, Our next speaker is uh, Daria Parhomenka. Dasha, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Guys and girls. <laughs> Yeah, do you see me? Yeah, do you hear me well, yes. right? Yes, 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 totally. Um, so I wanted to share with you today my thoughts of uh, um, last two months <laughs> and uh, this lockdown, which is influencing all us. I don't know is if Lev uh, already went to sleep. Uh, he's not here, right? He's not here. Yeah, he anymore. left. 
uh, he left. It's too late for him in Korea, right? Uh, it's uh, it was very um, similar. My thoughts with him that these last two months we are, you know, in a very special situation. Um, some of us found uh, themselves in in uh, you know lockdown in cities. Me, I found myself in a countryside. And I want to share with you my uh, experience, which of course it's very subjective and very individual, my, my personal thoughts and feelings of this lockdown and being completely two months in, uh, in nature. Uh, hi Lev, yeah, <laughs> I see you. Uh, actually, I see Lev for all my screen. <laughs> very funny. Uh, so, I think yeah. that uh, some people who, who found themselves, like me, countryside in, um, in, in let's say, uh, nature. Lev, you have to close YouTube. Completely oh, two months oh, you think? Okay. In, uh, in nature. Mine. Uh, hi, Lev. Okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I see you. Okay, okay, uh, yeah. Should I close something? Okay, it's okay, okay. Yes. All, all good now. Right. So I wanted to actually to uh, bring our attention to what's happening with us. So in this lockdown, we really lost so many cultural events. Usually, what we attend and professionally, actually, we are making this culture. So Lev was mentioning uh, visiting biennials or other cultural events. I'm thinking that this time was really very special for many for many of us who understood that you know on the one side we are running from nature uh, because virus is actually a nature and virus uh, is a part of nature. Uh, we want to protect ourselves with masks and gloves and uh, you know with this social distancing. But actually, it's what it's a part of it and what is going to any way to confront and to come into us. Um, the nature, actually, Timothy Morton is talking uh, about that, that uh, nature is actually a romantic term, romanticism term, which uh, in the uh, beginning of 19th century uh, was invented like people wanted to you know, to they they were always uh, feeling away from nature, and they were feeling like lost contact with it. And in a feeling sad nostalgia for nature, they were trying to reconnect. So my uh, idea is that this time um, we are all having this unique possibility to reconnect with nature how we can do this. For example, me staying uh, all this time uh, in my village uh, next to the river, communicating with the trees and, you know, trying to find some uh, new energy and new, uh, let's say, inspiration for my for my work, you know, every time, you know, working online in Zooms, uh, going out and breathing out in nature. Um, these thoughts, uh, you know, brought me uh, to uh, the feeling that the show we are going to open, I hope, in September, which was postponed as everywhere. It's uh, in our new space in Tretiakov Gallery. We are having a new space now, a permanent for laboratoria. Uh, and uh, the show, of course, it was made long ago. And it was, uh, of course, thought long ago, but it's completely the same idea what I was feeling last two months. The show is called May the Other Live in Me. And this May the Other Live in Me is about interspecies communication. And that's all about that human beings are not anymore uh, <clears throat> the tsars of nature. So we are not anymore... Uh, you know, um, governors on this planet. Other species uh, we call um, plants, animals, 
also software systems or uh, um, intelligent machines or of course viruses you know it's different species equal on the way to us so we need to find the ways to communicate and to integrate in this system in this way um i'm uh i'm feeling that you know art is really so often anticipating the future and what is happening uh, so this show we already were thinking like eight months ago, seven months ago, we're planning this show and only now, you know, all this situation is like really totally um, like everything was written on it. I wanted to show you several works we want, we will show in the, in, in the exhibition in uh, late September in Tretiakov Gallery. Uh, several works, I think that they really uh, correspond to this situation. Um, let me show the screen. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Demo. I hope you will see uh, the screen, the screen, oh, 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 oh. Do you see the screen with a tree? No? Yes. Da, you know, yes, 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 we can yes. see. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this installation by German uh, artist, Agnes May Brandes, with whom we work a lot, uh, called the One Tree ID, or How to Become a Tree for Another Tree. Uh, this installation we are uh, going to produce actually in Moscow, uh, especially for the show. This is a tree. and um especially for this tree we will um produce a perfume which will correspond completely to this tree so we will um <clears throat> we will measure aerosols uh, of the stem and of the leaves and roots different parts of the tree and send these aerosols to the artist and she will produce in berlin um, with her um, partner institution, the perfume, especially for this tree. And, the, and visitors who come to the exhibition, they can put on themselves this perfume and communicate with the tree. Uh, like the tree will feel that it's not a human being, but another tree in front of it. So this, this is a, this kind of uh, way of technological interface helping us to communicate with uh, another species, the plant itself. And one more, mm, oh no, I closed it. One more, sorry, I will find it. <laughs> one more uh, example what I wanted to show you is by Sasha Spachal, it's, she's an artist from Slovenia. And we are going to bring this work called Inspiration. Uh, this also, you know, very interesting that uh, masks in this installation, one of the key uh, instrument. And of course, after this pandemic, we will we all have totally different feelings of what is mask to us because usually ma mask uh, could be different connotation now it's completely that that we are covering our uh, respiratory um, parts uh, to protect from the virus here actually it's a, a breathing this system you see here now a tube a huge tube uh, filled with a, um, special bacteria. These bacteria, uh, they naturally live in soil, uh, many of them. And actually when people are next to the soil, like gardeners, they usually have a lot of these bacteria. The interesting thing is that these bacteria giving us uh, happiness. So they rise levels of uh, Oxytocin, uh, hormones like oxytocin and serotonin 
and um, in this system, the artist she uh, made this setup that we have a special breathing system coming to these masks. We inhale these bacteria of uh, um, happiness. And the plan was initially, the plan was, of course, that in, uh, in our exhibition, we are rising happiness for visitors. And um, it's uh, actually this work has uh, many layers, also philosophical layers, but I want just now to concentrate more on this breathing system. Uh, in the uh, what Stratyakov Gallery told us, so it's uh, we are we will come back really to the new world where people can't touch uh, artworks, you know, because first time it will be a huge distance between people, like two meters or one meter and a half between each visitor, and not no interactive installations, no touch. But I decided that still we are saving this installation, even if it's completely, you know, um, interactive, even if people could not interact with it. I want it to be shown um, in, the, in, in the, this exhibition um, because it's totally now, I mean, it's additional message, additional meaning of it now. I think you're all getting it. And um, what else I wanted to tell you? So finding, yes, again, myself in nature, I, I thought that um, actually it's a very happy time where we can reconnect with nature and understand it from, you know, for, from a, you know, local global point of view, not only like seeing some um, data or of what is happening, I don't know, like climate change or other global, you know, super big um, uh, processes that are coming. Uh, we can find it in a very local way, like temperature, humidity, uh, connecting with, uh, I don't know, water, like river, and mm, through these small elements, new elements, to find, uh, to, to understand and to uh, to reconstruct um, more uh, global. Um, vision of what is happening around. And um, the exhibition uh, we will have, to, uh, which we will have uh, after May the Other Live in Me, which is in September, will be actually about these new elements. I'm not sure that I have a lot more time to talk about it, and it's uh, quite a new, really, material. But I wanted to tell you that, you know, this whole situation, of course, it's really terrible what is happening in the world and many people are suffering, even dying of this virus. But I think it's somehow, um, you know, we never thought that culture could be paused, paused, uh, stopped, yeah, for some time functioning, but it happened. And nature is still living around us. It's uh, even if culture is not functioning, nature is here. And it doesn't matter what do we want to think of it, it's here. And it will, the new elements we will discover in uh, the show, the first show in 2021. And I'm very happy that I had in these two months, I had some time to think of it because usually we live in a, such a hurry, hurry uh, rhythm, like, you know, squirrels are running around. And uh, now um, I think actually much more normal lifestyle when people can have a long, medley, um, how you slowly, slowly talks 
and uh, think deeper. I actually would wish it to myself and to my colleagues. And um, yeah, uh, I re actually I'm fascinated by the name of the conference, Saving the World. So I would uh, wish to all of us try to save the world and together ourselves with it, with uh, our uh, very special work, which we can actually technological art or science art or art in general, of course, can help. I think I'm already in a time. If you want, I can talk more about new elements, but I'm... Uh, please do. We have time. Uh, unfortunately, yeah? uh, Ippolit Markelov uh, has some emergency situation in his lab. So mm. you are super welcome to show us more of your fascinating projects. We will be happy and I, I'm sure our viewers as well. Well, uh, actually, my presentation is not ready. I'm, uh, as you <laughs> but I can tell wish, you. Can I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can tell you a little bit more about the elements I, I just mentioned. Yeah, that I told you that the, the next exhibition, one after uh, after um, <clears throat> after May the other live in me, will be about the new elements. Uh, I want maybe to to tell you about one element uh, which I'm completely fascinated uh, it's crystals uh, why I want to mention this now because maybe some artists are watching this video now and then it will be a little bit like a, a announcement for some of them uh, so the crystals. I, I want to show you one of the works. Uh, it's about also crystal. It's an artist with who we work. Also, he will be for that show with crystals. Ralph Becker from Germany. And here you can see silicium. You know, kremni. Yeah, silicium, which uh, one of the most. Sorry. Uh, it's fine, yeah. Silicon. Silicon. Oh, what, what I said? Silicon. Silicon. Ah, sorry. Silicon. Uh, silicon. Uh, or polysilicon. Yeah. Uh, this element is used in um, in many computers. Yeah. Actually, that we are uh, thanks that we are that I mean we are streaming and hearing all all together each other now. Uh, it's thanks, by the way, to this crystal the silicon, which makes it happen and all our computers are working. So when I'm talking that um, finding different elements in nature, it gives us opportunity to connect with something um, particular and local you know, with some real element and expand it to the global scale and understand like what is, how the planet is functioning or living. So if we want to talk about uh, climate change, why not to talk about uh, especially air, not only to see the data of air pollution, but to see what kind of air we have here in this very village or in that city, or I don't know, in Korea, in Barcelona, or in the US or whatever. And through some local, so through some very specific elements to understand what is happening global. This actually is elemental approach and elemental media. Maybe some of you read about this. And this is a Staroselsky, um, <clears throat> uh, the scholar, uh, his name is Staroselsky, he wrote about it, about these elements. And uh, crystals are one of the key, really exciting elements for this new exhibition for me now. What I'm uh, going to do, we are going to open, uh, in our lab we have a production uh, program, new production program called Incubator. Uh, and uh, in this incubator, we have uh, possibilities to invite artists to scientific labs. 
and this is a plan for this fall. I hope it won't be postponed. So we'll have artists to bring to the labs who, which work with the uh, <clears throat> new materials and crystals and growing crystals. It's also very, very um, perspective area of research uh, that uh, now not any, even a specific scientist can <clears throat> find a difference between artificially grown crystal or uh, the crystal uh, which is from nature. That's about um, diamonds, for example. Mm, I think I'm okay. If I would be really happy if my colleagues can join uh, and we can. Mm, yeah, let's let's do some, some sort of a roundtable discussion. Uh, yes, from so I had really like your... a flow of thoughts, uh, not really well prepared. I'm sorry uh, with my presentations, but very sincere. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, can you also stop the screen sharing, please? Ah, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask you about um, Natasha also. I, I, can I ask some question? I wanted to ask you uh, about the space. Because uh, they, as I heard, you now uh, the uh, our uh, laboratory is in Tretikov Gallery, right? So the exhibition will be there. Right, yeah, we, we've got an invitation from uh, Tretikov Gallery uh, mm -hmm. to, to be a partners and they gave us a space in a new Tretikov. It's in a, where a former houses of artists was. So now we are, actually we were, you know, interrupted in the stage of our renovation. It's a very beautiful space, not so big. I know that many artists are really waiting to see how it is. So it's a very beautiful in a sense, it's like spacious and it's, uh, uh, it's actually, yeah, it's uh, very easy to find it, <laughs> let's say it. And, uh, the program is that we will have around three, four exhibitions per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, of course there it's, you know, much depends on funding. It's the most difficult part as usual, unfortunately, as usual, but uh, yeah, we hope for better. It's about the space, yeah. And it will be, of course, a lot of discussions there uh, for lab and for uh, art science community in Russia, uh, in Moscow, of course, it's very important that we again will have a physical space where we all can meet and uh, on a permanent uh, uh, I mean, yes, a permanent uh, <laughs> okay, so regularly, so we regular always basis. You know where to find us, yeah. Uh, this is so. This is a new Tretikov building. Yes. Uh, sorry again. It's going to be so where, where your lab, where lab is going to be in the exhibition space. It's in the new Tretikov okay. building. Yes. Right. Wow! Yes. Congratulations. Mm, you only had to you. wait. You only had. You only had to wait about two hundred years for this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, we the first show is in two thousand. Uh, this year in uh, 28th of September, it's the date of where we open. Actually, we should open in June, uh, uh, should be 9th of June, but it was postponed. It was postponed to September. Yeah, and I hope that uh, we all can meet there uh, also physically, but uh, now, of course, we all experience so comfortably uh, sitting in our uh, places where we are and still uh, talking to each other. But, you know, I believe that still to see the exhibition, uh, to really to see the exhibition, we need physical space. Uh, I don't think that uh, it will be a substitute for a real exhibition. So, I mean, online show, we also help, hold, we, we, we hold the online show 
when the pandemic started in, in March, uh, no, in, in April. Uh, but I think uh, to feel yourself and to, you know, to connect physically, it's important. Can I, can I maybe add something? Oh, sorry. Natalia, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I had just uh, several small remarks. I, um, it's not, uh, not a question, it's just like shared feeling. Um, so you were talking about the masks and how suddenly their meaning changed completely. Like, uh, Sasha's Pachal work was about happiness and about this connection with um, this very basic yeah. element and about um, the inhalation as participating in something. Well, usually when you inhale something, it becomes part of you. So if you inhale a little bit of happiness, you become happy. But suddenly uh, inhalation became uh, so toxic, so problematic, so, and also so sensible. Like we constantly, uh, I don't know how you felt in the beginning of the pandemic. I was constantly again, listening to my lungs and um, thinking whether you know we we um, we um, uh, whether I'm still breathing correctly, whether you know this whole uh, civilization is breathing correctly. S such a um, uh, we were just talking with Olga about this change um, uh, needs to disconnect uh, the metaphors, to decipher the metaphors, to reformulate the metaphors. So suddenly mask is, um, it will probably remain the symbol of this pandemic. Like if you wanted to talk about this pandemic 50 years from now, you probably, probably use the mask. And my second remark was about the shared space physical and not physical space for the few months i was very convinced that you that actually things only exist if they exist offline things online they half exist but now i'm changing my mind like we still had this three months of history and how are we going to talk about it so what what, what has happened to us and that's something that, that i'm super curious about Liam, go ahead. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I comment just yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come right. back uh, very quickly? Uh, yeah, I want uh, to say that to the first comment, you know, the first two weeks were very stressful for me because me and my team, we tried, you know, to be very efficient from morning to evening, you know, Zooms. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were trying to, uh, you know, um, really to... Uh, you know, neglect all this postponing. So we were trying to think all is normal. But then, you know, we breathe out. And what I told you, you know, my inspiration became a nature. So uh, going away from the house and running in the field. Or mm -hmm. even, you know, I before I was always afraid to go for a walk when is it when it is rain. Now mm -hmm. I think all weather is good. Yeah. It's just, okay, I will put on, uh, you know, a very coat. Uh, maybe it look not so nice, but I'm here in the countryside. No one see me. And I'm so enjoying it. And also, you know, yeah, I, 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 st I, I, I never been for two months in the countryside, you know, even for the holidays maximum two weeks, or we were coming here only for a weekend. And now I would tell you honestly, I don't want to come back to the city. I don't want to come back to the city. I want to connect deeper and, uh, you know, to bring it to my professional life and my interests, nature. The second thing, what you, Natasha, you are saying that, of course, maybe online is so productive. You know, yes, it is productive, but what will happen with, what will happen with the museums? Because now we are in such a close collaboration with Tretiakov Gallery, and uh, so we are in touch with them, and I know how they suffer. You know, because they need, their function is, I mean, we also need to think how our colleagues I uh, think also our neighbor is a theater director and he, he, he said all my plays are stopped. He's out of any, any, I don't know, 
any job, any work. He, he said, I'm just signing uh, for free all these online shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also, you know, how we will live, of course. Also, the Tretiakov Gallery, they also say that uh, this year, next year, what will happen? So also like Hermitage or this museum, which I used to have huge excursion tours and tourists from abroad. And uh, actually they earn from uh, these excursions. They have only one third of governmental fi fi finance support. Only one third. Well, yeah. So, so I want to add, uh, add something. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah, well, so first of all, you know, when you started, yeah, just a few points, small points. So when you started to talk about kind of invention of nature, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's actually uh, before that book, it's already been, I already heard about as a student, yeah, so it's kind of well understood with the concept of nature in, in the West. Uh, right, emerges in the 18th century um, in parallel to civilization. Although, if we look at Asia, for example, right, I think it's very different, right? Like, if you look at the ancient, in the mid, uh, right, I mean, Chinese Korean art, the nature is obviously very present, and um, the nature basically is the main subject, right? Of this beautiful black and white painting, as opposed to just kind of part or as opposed to kind of the background of human action, like it was in the West, right? But what I was thinking, right, so before um, kind of this development, right, of modern um, city and urbanization, you know, uh, like most intellectuals, writers, philosophers, you know, we're creating basically in the country states, uh, in the you know, villages, you know, we now remembered how Pushkin wrote like all, all Russian literature like in one month, right, in isolation in his village. It's longer and, than one uh, month. <laughs> no, I know. And you know, there are, I, mean, I was reading a global press, right? I was reading a global press, I was reading some articles with already many people, you know, in a, let's say upper, upper middle class, rich class, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to kind of moving out to the cities. Um, so um, if this crisis, you know, continues and, you know, it may continue for years, right? Uh, I don't want to sound negative, but usually it takes 10, 20 years to develop vaccine, right? So this idea will be available at the end of the year, and to be, to, I mean, who knows, right? Uh, you know, maybe, but you know, maybe in fact, you know, uh, we will see certain move to outside, and uh, it made me think. But in fact, the development, of what you all guys like so much, which is contemporary art and high culture, right? It actually, it actually happens only because of the cities, right? So first impressionist exhibitions, 1870s, and that's exactly when right, kind of. Kind of Urbanization happens uh, between 1830 and uh, 1900. The population of Lodz was doubling every 10 years. <laughs> um, and um, so, what I want to say, just to be a bit of a devil's advocate, you know, let's just remember the culture. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally you know, sympathetic to you know uh, all of you and and you know, theater directors and dancers and museums. But let's just remember, right? But most of the world doesn't have access to this, right? Most of the world doesn't live in Moscow, you know, Paris, Berlin, and so on. And the contemporary culture includes plenty of things which are uh, perfectly well consumed from the screen, video games, right? uh, movies, TV shows, I mean, Instagram, popular photography. So I'm obviously all for, you know, the crisis passing. I'm all for theaters in effect. Russia is a great example. I mean, Russia is kind of the only country now where, in fact, avant-garde theater is very popular, uh, right? If, you know, so, so I think Russia is a great example where people are kind of hungry for the physical avant-garde forms. But uh, we are, you know, we are in a kind of privileged space, and you know, the billions of people are kind of happily interacting, consuming whatever word you want to use of cultural line, um, and. Um, so not everything requires physical space, right? Um, so we, should, you know, so we just have to keep this in mind. You know, I think in our in our discussion, you know, that's all. I was actually thinking, and I probably might sound provocative, and I agree to uh, this remark that uh, Lev has made that we don't actually know how long this crisis is going to take and how transformative it's going to be to uh, very many um, 
parts of culture. And then when you talk about the theater and when you talk about the museum, is uh, pandemic their only problem? Like, really? Is it the first time that we understand that, you know, something needs to be changed about Hermitage? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not being as radical as saying that no one needs to go there and no tourists should come. But, you know, I mean, an institution as Hermitage, um, I want her for them to, you know, to move a little bit, you know, try to think about different ways of doing things, not the way they used to be doing them in the last hundred years. So uh, I'm not, uh, you know, um, saying that we need to destroy the museums. I'm very far from this, but uh, I mean, and the Russian theaters, which are uh, highly overfinanced compared to other branches of Russian culture. So, I mean, uh, it's not a revolutionary statement, but that's, you know, a question uh, of what they were doing before and uh, how well that can be translated to maybe mm, or maybe a little bit larger masses than Moscow and St. Petersburg. Yeah, actually someone wrote in chat now and I agree uh, that Hermitage and big museums are like really touristic sites. Yeah, mostly touristic yeah. sites. That's for yeah, I, well, I wrote it. <laughs> ah, yes, well, I, I, I basically said that it's a museum, but in some ways it's more like a tourist site, like Eiffel Tower, maybe, right? Because you go over because it's famous, uh, as opposed to a you know, garage, maybe. Yeah, that's another uh, super fascinating thing to think of. Like, we were all irritated by tourists, weren't we? Uh, we were all not liking being tourists, but liking being investigators, nomads. So what 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 will become of all of this? Well, actually, I wanted to say thank all of you for this interesting discussion. And now Ilder will introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you, Dasha, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Nice to see all. Yes, <laughs> really nice. Very nice. To see so many people. Ilda. <laughs> Hi, again. So yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dasha, for your talk. I was ha very happy to see you among yeah. our participants uh, because, uh, like, I uh, respect you as one of the most, uh, like, sort of seriously well preparing people on our uh, art and science Russian scene. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you hear me well? It feels like I do have some problems with connection. Yes, Someone? we can hear oh, you. Nice. Nice. Yes, right. yes, we can hear good, you. Good, good. So th thanks everyone, and especially for the uh, round table conversation. Uh, we have uh, Lulia with us here. Uh, can you please uh, turn your mic on and the camera. Do, do you hear us? Hi. So uh, you just dropped back. OK, we have some uh, connection problem with our next speakers. Meanwhile, she connects back. Uh, I will just maybe, uh, Lena, can you please join the, the, the talk? And I will help Luli with connecting back because I think she needs some help to do that. Thank you so much. Well, maybe we can also discuss something with, with uh, uh, Dasha, Lev. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, because we have uh, some some problems. Well, I actually wanted to uh, to mention uh, that I think it's a really, really great uh, moment uh, when such kind of things like Tragic of Gallery uh, now will have your lab like uh, as a part of the institution. I think this is really great. I mean, uh, the space. 
Yeah, but we are not a part of institution. Uh, yeah, we are, are we will be independent. Yeah, you are independent, but you have the space uh, in this like, yes. space. They just gave us a space uh, for free. Yeah, huh? just they told us, please do your projects, and uh, we give you a space, and we want to have you. you I think we hear guys. Uh, can you switch off your mic? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. Just... yeah. If it's interesting for you, yeah. Uh, just a few deta details. Yeah. So we have a space, and we give them our unique content which they are interested in. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I would say it's very. You know, symbolic that a treaty of memory, very institution of Muslim, wants um, uh, technological art, <laughs> and this is of course a lot of. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's really cool for all of us that it means that technological art is not uh, marginal anymore. And uh, like the huge museums are interested to have this content. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great moment. Yeah, just so, to be clear, we are not part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that you have a space in this traditional institution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. I, I would really be happy to see you all when we can get again. Uh, and I'm interested, can we, you know, come closer to each other or it will be always a distance? <laughs> I don't know how it is now because, <laughs> yeah. So the next speaker is here. Yeah, we go. Yeah, let's give the screen space to Lulia. Hi. Okay. Hi. We're, we're Hi. happy that you managed to connect. Yeah, likewise. I think there's a bit of a delay, but uh, and we'll make it work. That's all fine. It's amazing. It's amazing how slow the internet here is in Los Angeles. Oh, We've got 5G and towers everywhere and it's still slow yeah uh, same same here in like russia in saint petersburg when i am currently residing and at moscow where helena is yeah it feels like pandemics made something uh yeah the, like yeah. <laughs> i'm sure there was an unexpected weight yeah, it's not capable of dealing with the pandemics so uh, okay uh, i leave the right. screen space screen space to you and thanks for joining us Happy to see you again because last yeah, time like we met that. on CTM and we, Helena actually, uh, my co-curator, uh, she also was at your talk and that was so inspiring and wonderful. So thanks for that. Yes. And that is amazing. <laughs> so yeah, you're welcome. Okay, good to go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I, there's just, Obviously, I've, I've had a lot of recent perspective uh, being in the United States, being in L.A. Um, and having the things go on around me. So I'm going to touch on that. But there's a lot of a lot of intersection I find on the concept of um, normalcy, which is a funny word to begin with, because this is more commonly what is used this is the most normal word to refer refer to this concept now, but it's wrong. It was actually um, spoken wrongly by a president in the past, um, and then it was repeated enough times mimetically that it kind of took superior, uh, superior uh, use away from the actual real word, which is normality. Um, so this is, this is the, in, in, uh, the input part of this concept that I wanna jump into. So. Um, there are these very basic fundamental uh, aspects of thinking that we almost don't even think about because they're so common and they're so normal. Um, but sometimes when we just let these things develop, um, at, at our very foundation, we can have flaws in our thinking that no matter how much genius we put on top of that, there are still some mechanical flaws be beneath the surface that are uh, preventing us from the level of applicable um, functionality that we have as an intelligent person. So um, thinking about intelligence, not necessarily like how much money do you have equals wealth, but how much money you can effectively spend equals wealth. Um, so um, there, there are instances in which um, as a transgender person, especially, um, I, 
I, I had this time period in my life right when I began transitioning where um, I, I didn't feel any more like I was the person that I used to be. I felt like um, so many of those characteristics were built off of a mistake in my identity, a mistake in my gender. And, and uh, suddenly seeing how many different dysfunctional situations in my life were linked to just this one very slight detail, something that everybody thought was a given um, and something that everybody never thought to question because it's so drastically outside of what they consider to be normal that it seems impossible or, or improbable to even pursue. Um, sadly, that's also where a lot of discovery exists is outside of what we consider to be possible or probable or normal and takes a certain kind of insanity to try and find these things. Um, but so the, there was this time period during my transition in which I, I, I sort of felt like I realized the performative nature of identity and, and how this, the concept of self is something that really doesn't have much detail. It's really just an innate existence of all living things. Um, so in that, I was like invalidating my identity, my former identity, the name I was given, the gender, all of the details that I had built, uh, all of the things that I had gone through and the ways that I used to be, all of this stuff was being audited, um, going through and checking every, every single perspective on things, how I treated women, how I regarded myself, how I, you know, how, how self-confident I was, and really just checking all of these things. In this time period, uh, there was a complete dissolution of identity because I, I didn't just instantly become who I am now. I, I, I had to stop being who I was. And then there was this moment in between that in which there's a sort of eye of the storm in which you experience yourself without identity to a certain degree. Um, you know, there are certain things like aesthetic and location that you can't separate from, but everything else seemed to be pretty easy to separate from. And then my experiences in nature seemed to back this up. So I, I, I go out into the middle of the woods and suddenly my name, my gender, all of the stories I have, all my, all my trophies, awards, my degree, the papers I wrote, none of that stuff matters at all out in nature. Um, and so that only really applies here in civilization. Um, and so then what am I really without all of that stuff? I, I'm just another manifestation of this sort of um, uh, not identityless life, but definitely without specific character or a character that is just so complex that most of us deny it its identity. So here's my visual aid right here. These are us. These are us. Each of us is an individual. We have autonomy. We've got our own characteristics, our own personality. But this is actually us, all of this here. And we can just go around and, and do whatever, but this doesn't really work very well for productivity. You need to be able to work in unison. You need to be able to have unified directions. And so we lack this a lot right now because we're very lost in identity, not just exploring identity, but owning identity owning it with this sort of a uh, false pride in a way that um, makes it so that we feel that ourselves are in some way the um, standard uh, calibration to refer to whenever judging everything else out around. Um, this creates so many um, instances of, of, of superiority and um, something like nationalism um, or, or uh, racism. These are based off of people saying, I identify so much with this specific um, aspect of uh, existence. I don't identify with the whole totality of existence. I just, I, I just identify with this little specific bit. And then me as this finger thinks that everything else on this hand is wrong and it needs to stop or something like that. And this is so deeply wrong. And, and, and these things seem just very creatively expressed, but 
if you apply these uh, expressions to uh, real life situations that are affecting you know, mass amounts of people, and these mass amounts of people are the people that are really creating culture. It's not just specialists like me or you who are saying interesting things or doing interesting things. It's all of the people that are out there actually installing these um, mimetic things into existence. Um, and so, um, if we don't get some of these flaws of our of our personality down, um, it, it it's like you could have all of the knowledge in the world and just suck at using it. Um, and so then I find myself to be somewhat intelligent, yet um, I didn't follow academic pursuits. I specifically tried to not read books. I I, I did all of these things that smart people told me this is not smart. Um, <laughs> but what I did understand then is that there's a lot of um, intelligence in the applicability of knowledge. Um, so, so, so to focus more on um, uh, teaching people how to think functionally, um, how to think effectively, and, and how, to, how to be critical of their own thinking in a way that it promotes those things, rather than teaching them, you don't be racist because this is specifically, you teach them how to have already known that ahead of time. Um, and this sort of leads to another topic. So I am all over the place, and I think that's important too. Let's consider this a non-sequential presentation. We are going to jump around, and we, because of that, we're going to look at the whole topic at the same time instead of this part, then this part. Okay, so this brings us to behavior control, another problem in society. And, and, and before I go on, I just want to side point out that Yes, it's amazing what we can do with AI. And yes, there are superior beings being built right now. But we also have a say in how they are built. We have a say in what their personality is, even if it's unbiased. And we have a say in the applications of these things and what laws and policies are passed that allow us to do and not do certain things. Um, so it's, it's inseparable. You, you don't have to be into politics to give a shit about what's going on in the rest of the world socially because we can't just advance intellectually and have this surge of intelligence happen without the entire rest of the body coming with us. Um, and so, yes, there's always going to be some fall off and some advancement, but we can't just mutate. We have to figure out how to bring this stuff inclusively into the world around us to effectively solve old problems that we just haven't gone through and audited in the collective personality. So something like policing. Recently in Minneapolis, uh, thinking outside of normality, normality um, the police suggested for the first time ever that I know of in history, maybe the police force isn't necessary. Maybe we should disband the entire police force of this metropolitan city and um, focus on a, a public safety sort of team instead of a team of policing that has these all these standards of identity built into them, which allow them to do things like become the kind of people that will just beat you in the face with a stick, shoot you at point blank range with something that makes your face explode. You know, this that people died from getting tear gassed in these protests and none of it even needed to happen, but installed wrongfully in the identity of policing are these things that allow these kinds of dysfunctional behaviors that ultimately work against other parts of our own body. And so that's something people need to pay attention to also, is that it's considered normal right now to sort of work against each other because of how we identify as individuals and how that contrasts with each other and how that creates a competitive, competitive environment in a broken mind. Um, but, uh, <laughs> ah, fuck, I got lost. <laughs> it's, like, it's like skateboarding. You're just going, you're going, you're going, and then you do a trick and you fall or whatever. So, all right, let's 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 change topics. <laughs> so there, there, there are these flaws in mind, things like jumping to an assumption instead of a conclusion, but calling it a conclusion because you didn't have the lucidity to realize that you had just done an assumption so that it's late, you know, because you didn't feel like putting as much effort into exploring inaccuracy or something like this. Um, or there's, uh, as, as previously stated, they're speaking from your identity instead of being able to not, not have to surrender your identity, like, like, how dare these people try to take my identity from me, 
but more so just put it on the side so that you can look at the problem as if you were the hand instead of the finger. Um, and, and so the, 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 the reason that I focus more on the social aspects of evolution and, and being able to simply think, audaciously think uh, that I can just talk people into uh, you know, augmented ways of thinking, um, the, <laughs> the, this comes from the, the mimetic capability that has pro proven itself over and over in humanity. You know, uh, within two days, something can be spreading around the world on the internet to an extreme, a trend, a picture, whatever it is. And then also with Corona, we saw just how fast, with a physical model, how, th how fast things can spread mimetically within our culture, with how much we communicate physically between each other um, and how much we connect in each other's space physically. So everybody the, the, that has the nihilistic perspective of like, okay, um, the species is fucked socially, you know, it's just gonna like run itself into the ground. I think this is so wrong because they see, see all the problems and they see the mass of people and it seems so daunting, but with something that is, has enough mimetic momentum, uh, this stuff can work for you. You just have to be able to install it properly. There are explosions going on outside my house right now. There, there have been rioters out there. There's, there's people that are responding to it being like a lawless state and they're just like doing whatever the fuck. Uh, the, the cops were driving down the street in their cars with rubber bullet machine guns and just shooting people, doing drive-by shootings on people for being out past curfew. So yeah, I'm, I, I was, I'm not political either and I wasn't into social stuff either, but, but we just, we, we just proved this extremely important point that I want to also refer to. And, and that's that um, all of this social stuff, it's, it's, it's about diminishing the points of opposition that we have with our own body so that we can all work together as a thing. And, and, and so that's all fine and good if we all want to be our own little isolated specialists, but there's amazing um, uh, proof, especially just right now with, with how big of changes can be made really fast when we do them collectively. Um, so um, there have been, there have been um, uprisings, riots, um, police brutality, all of this stuff has been in the United States since I've, since I've been a, a thinking adult. Um, but what happens is it's one isolated incident. So what then they do on the media is they say, oh, it was these specific protesters, it was this one bad seed of a cop and we fired him and then everybody moves on. But the thing that was so special about this and the reason that this changed the world um, is that all of these cities, something like, something like 35 cities in the United States all at the same time were doing their own demonstrations. If it would have been one demonstration, that would not have exposed the flaws in policing and in the sadism of policing and in the um, instigation of riots and, and all of this stuff. Even though if you were there at that one riot, you would have seen that. You would have seen the police start the riot. You would have seen um, uh, instigators like breaking stuff and blaming it on protesters. But you don't get that story on the news and the news is the one with all the mimetic influence. Um, so what was really special about this is there was too much on the news from too many different places all at the same time. You couldn't say that one person was crazy or that one situation was up for interpretation. You were just watching it everywhere all at the same time. And that was because together we had a unifying motive. We didn't need to be alike each other. We didn't need to have the same gender or identity or background or speak the same language or have the same political views or anything like that. We just had to agree that this was fucked up and wrong and we weren't going to allow it. And so then with that, with the power that happened when there was a unified motive between us and that unified motive was collected through mimetic efforts on social media, um, and, and through a, a sort of unified value system that was also brought out through the exposure of these sorts of injustices. And, 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 and because of that, we have things like um, now uh, the uh, LA Police Department has cut $150 million worth of its budget to get back to um, uh, financially disadvantaged communities. And the Minnesota Police Department is considering disbanding policing to replace it with a compassionate um, a, a replacement or whatever. Um, and, and, and aside from that, all these other people were called to action in a way that's like, you know what, if we stand up for something, we literally can make change. We just watched it. We just made it happen. 
those people burnt down a police station and then changes were made in police corruption. This is, this is um, a brilliant example of how the rest of the body is coming with us. We need these physical changes, not just the, the mental ones. We can't just assume that building AI is gonna make it so that it's applicable to everyone or that everybody has the wisdom or understanding socially to know how to apply it without excluding other people or to know how to apply it without it becoming something that gets out of hand in a dangerous direction too. Um, so it's not just about technology. So the, 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 the whole social body, the whole collective body needs to come with us as well. I also think too, something that changed for a lot of people, especially in the United States, because we lost 40 million um, jobs and then they gave us one stimulus check of $1,200 to last for three months. Um, and so this is a lot of people in poverty all at the same time feeling like their identity was based off of their career and that's been removed. Um, I'm getting a little bit off the track of normality, but this is just just flooding, um, nonstop perspective being in the middle of this situation. Um, but I think I think in order to make these kinds of changes, people need to change how they view death in a way that makes it so that they're willing to take the bargain between if I stand up for what's right, I might die, but that's okay because at least I'll have felt like my life had value instead of feel ashamed of myself for just sitting complacently while an injustice went on or something like that. And so there's this other view on death that can be had where it's not something that is the ultimate consequence. And, and maybe it's better in those moments because we really don't know about death. Another flaw in the very most fundamental parts of our thinking, we don't know. Doesn't matter what religion you came from, you don't know. Doesn't matter how many deaths you've watched, you don't know. Um, so we can try to measure it and we can look at it like this mystery, but I, I, I can't sit here comfortably and feel like that I can in any way say anything intelligent about the definition of death without just calling it a mystery. Um, and so since something like that is so deeply ingrained in our uh, decision making and how safe we feel doing things and how reserved we feel doing things, um, that, that simply just changing this detail, so you start toying with these fundamental categories of your brain. Like, like what, if, what if I change how I view death? What different outcomes do I get in myself behaviorally or mentally? Um, and you start going through your, your entire personality as if it was a toy that you were circuit bending. You're touching different connections to different connections in a modular fashion. And you're finding, oh, this personality of mine that I considered to be concrete, that I never even once questioned because questions like that were considered so unlawful outside of the normality that I was taught and outside of the normality that I considered myself to be in, that I never even asked those questions. So what other questions aren't we asking? You know, what other questions are we afraid to ask because we're afraid it's gonna make us look stupid or we're afraid it's gonna be a waste of our time or, or we're afraid that's just so far outside of what we would consider to be normal that we couldn't possibly, you know, these things hold back science. And, and in, the in, 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 in the concept of culture and society progressing too, the people who are making all of the decisions for all of the laws, these aren't the most sci scientifically progressive people most of the time. And I hear this over and over from scientists. Oh, I've, I've got this brilliant hypothesis or specialty, uh, but the funding, I can't get the funding or whatever. And so we need these changes in our, our, our social understanding to make it so that we can get the functionality socially that's going to get the resources from where they are to the to where the people can apply them and where their genius can be something that they just didn't collect in wealth in their brain, but they can have a wealth of application of it. And so it's really dangerous what we consider to be normal and what we consider to be abnormal. That's a dividing line because when you think about it, everything in existence is normal. We just have a limited understanding of normality if we consider something to be abnormal. We just misunderstood the identity of reality if we think anything that happens is abnormal. Or we're being biased because some of the stuff is so horrific we prefer a reality in which it wasn't normal. Um, but sadly it is. And when we accept what is inside of our normality that is flawed or diseased or creating dysfunction or disease, we can target these things. And so, so, so focusing just on the in intelligence and the technological aspect, it's like having a car and just building up the engine and making it full of power. 
but then never unchaining it from the posts. You know, you have to, you have to also take, uh, remove the things that are weighing down the rest of the progress at the same time. And as much as I believe in um, AI to be able to help us in those things, I think without the right understanding of uh, society and, and diversity, um, I don't think we're going to be able to apply those things without some flaws and uh, um, much on the same topic, if we install these very fundamental flaws into the birthing of, I, of AI, that these things are going to be a lot harder to find later after they've been buried in, in so much coding of growth of, over all the generations of itself, all the different versions. Um, I, I can I can just keep going. I mean, I uh, <laughs> yeah yeah. Just tell me. Tell me. <laughs> we feel like uh, at this point we can sort of give, give you a round of applause and try to maybe do some sort of a, a sort of roundtable discussion. <laughs> if anyone wants to join, so uh, Helena, Helena uh, Natalia, who else is there? If anyone wants to talk for a while. I think Helena is looking for our... Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for your wonderful talk. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, and I really like the idea uh, about like normality, but what can we do like just to stop using this term and this like concept, construct of normality? Because what is normal? Well, AI can just uh, uh, like uh, quantify some something what is in the middle and say this is normal. But it's of, obviously, it's not normal. It's just something like, uh, um, well, it, it's just numbers. And uh, well, uh, so what do you think? Should we just stop using this concept of normality? Um, I, I, there's certainly some flaws in it, um, and um, I guess that would that would be similar to um, how I was thinking about, which is let's expand the concept of normality. But I don't think we should deny something like this. I think a lot of advanced thinking is about acknowledging the simultaneity of concepts. So, um, on one hand, um, the uh, the philosophical lack of normality would be beneficial. But then on the other hand, it can be um, effective in other situations to be able to find that common middle ground and what is the most central point. But then if we, you know, we can bias to the center as well. Um, so if we just go to that center and we don't have the divergences, uh, which is something that I think is one of the few things that sets people um, apart from AI is our ability to dysfunction and learn and grow from these dysfunctions and unpredictable occurrences. Um, so our, our sort of innate um, ability to defy normality um, is something that at least we as a species have clumsily used for progress. And maybe AI has um, a way to synthesize that, I don't know. Um, so it has a function, yes, but um, if we are applying it uh, to a social lens, it has a different function than if we apply it to a technological lens or something like that. Yeah, so I, th I think it, if, if, if we if we treat all these concepts like we don't just need to know what it is, we need to know when to apply it and when not to apply it and when it's the right tool to apply. Yeah, when uh, speaking about AI, it's funny like w what twist uh, the uh, notion of normal takes because that's exactly how it sort of works in certain times in many uh, Impl impl implications like to generate uh, a phrase it just sort of chooses the that would be normal to follow the previous word and um, like yeah but that's not how <laughs> humans compose the text <laughs> absolutely um, I also uh, pretty much enjoyed your uh, like hand explanation. I think <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I will I, I will sort of uh, add it to our like speaker's guide how you prepare <laughs> the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I guess the conference is sort of like that too. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, what 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 it's reminded me is something I saw I guess on Instagram. I think there was uh, some quote from someone uh, like. Uh, speaking about the uh, sort of uh, sorry i have to 
take it up. Think about, so uh, uh, telling about the um, uh, stupidity of uh, this, uh, like, racial biases and other stuff because we are not like she said that like we are not born with bigotry or racism this is what we learn we don't have any dna or something for racism this is what we learned to be so we just have to unlearn and uh don't don't be ignorant and that's what what it is like we just have to accept and acknowledge another fingers <laughs> this yeah. is just that and we also have some comment from youtube uh, uh, people asking, uh, not sure whether my comment was sent. The problem is that abnormal is uh, equated to bad and in people's mind, which is sh which it, it shouldn't. So there is a need to emphasize that deviation is not bad. I think that's, I think that's true as well. Um, I think a lot of this comes from uh, when we see deviation just for the sake of deviation. Um, and that people feel somewhat a uh, level of uh, like embarrassed or distance themselves from that kind of deviation because it seems frivolous um, to deviate and then apply that in a way seems um, seems more valid in in the collective mind than to just deviate for um, for the sake of deviating or something like that. Um, and it seems like the the collective identity will definitely reject that a lot more. Um, but at the same time, too, they're very interchangeable because. Uh, if we are a collective body, we're sharing perspectives. And so one person looking at me is thinking that I'm abnormal is going to look really abnormal to me. How could they possibly act that way? But that's because they don't know what it's like to be me. And I don't know what it's like to be them. And so this acknowledgement of there being um, like a place in which uh, conflict can exist without it actually being um, acted upon. So we can just acknowledge that we are both normal and abnormal at the same time and to different people in varying degrees. Um, this is the only accurate way to look at that. And when we try to get, when we, when we get sort of lost in either or thinking instead of um, bigger picture or simultaneity thinking, um, that's when a lot of conflict happens. Like, um, yes, but, or, 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 well, I think, and that's when the debate starts, but really we're, we're both contributing to a, a bigger topic that's like, yes, that too. Also, in addition, <laughs> yeah. how how like does does it feel like feel like uh, outside with those like flashes and explosions <laughs> like, from from our even from our like uh, far away distant look that's so like kind of uh, I would say for me personally it's kind of scary it looks like sort of like civil warish situation yeah yeah. Um, at, at certain points more so than others in certain areas. And it's really surreal the way in which um, you'll have a 10 block area of the city be basically a lawless war zone. And then outside of that, it's like the birds are chirping and somebody's going for a run and you don't even know. Um, but after the first couple nights, people started boarding up all their, um, all their buildings and the curfew was getting earlier and earlier. Um, so, um, you were just driving through a ghost town, which is really surreal when you're in something like Hollywood or, you know, busiest parts of LA and it's just all spray painted and boarded up like, like you went quickly, you took off your mask of, of uh, high society luxury and suddenly you were just this, you know, um, uh, dilapidated, falling apart civilization beneath or something. So it was definitely unsettling, lots of helicopters, you're trying to sleep and um, like um, I've, I've been in a riot before and I have PTSD from that. So I, I was shot at in that riot. So every time there's like a loud explosion, I'm like uh, having like a gunshot reaction or something like, like, oh no, like, <laughs> um, so it's it, it, on one hand, I'm like, wow, this is very difficult. On the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm like, without being like glad that it happened, I think it was important that um, the United States saw this kind of stuff happen to, on our own familiar areas instead of like over in foreign countries where we've been starting conflict like this for a long time. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just, uh, it, it, it's been so dramatically changing here to, to go from COVID to that and then right back to COVID. And, and, and um, I'm, I'm happy for the interruption in the normality that this has created though, because it forced all these people to be separated from 
um, what they consider to be normal and with that find a new normality. And um, I, I think that that's something that is, uh, makes, makes normality good is that it's not, it's not like, um, it's not like we're, uh, we find it and then we just keep it. It's like we are a constantly, um, we're, we're, we're a species that's constantly trying to normalize things and succeeding pretty well at it. Um, so as soon as you have a normality, there's a new one to go to. You just have to find it and define it and be lucid enough to make that transition. Yeah, totally. Uh, we are also having uh, one speaker, one last speaker joining us uh, soon. Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have to we have to ex extend our time for, <laughs> for a few oh, minutes. Okay. <laughs> sure. Like somewhere. Should we should we sing a song? <laughs> okay. What do you want? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> saving the world. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Saving the world is so amazing. Saving the world. Here, look, it's you. Uh, Helena. Oh, oh wow. wow. Is that me? Nice. <laughs> ah. So, let's try to bring some sense to this time. So, uh, <laughs> did you ever... Uh, received any invitations to participate in other online uh, events or something or this is your first one this is my first one um except for other other than music so i'm always playing music or um um i i've given a couple interviews but it's all very focused on my music and and that I'm, I'm really i'm really grateful to have the opportunity to you know speak and also like be involved in a different kind of culture as well yeah, but uh, so you did already perform music online during this lockdown. Yeah, a couple of times. Oh, cool. What, what was that like? The same type of like twelve hours long sessions or not? <laughs> um, usually they were shorter. I think I did a seven hour one. Um, yeah. I, I I did like a four hour one in the bathtub with an interview in the bathtub. Um, that's what was that was kind of interesting about it too is that as the artist, then you can have. In your entire control over the like you know entire experience then um so you're not just someone who's on the screen um playing your instrument you're like i can make a whole setting i can make a costume i can like do a visual performance with this and that's something that's usually not very practical to do on stage or in the middle of nowhere yeah sure i think when the lockdown is finally over we'll we will have to invite you to some of our festivals <laughs> yeah because yeah, uh, yeah, because what you uh, spoke about your like a long performance it sounded really interesting, and I actually I never attended anything like that. I think <laughs> like about the longest uh, set I uh, attended was something you just mentioned as the shortest one. It's a four hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Uh, have you uh, ever attended something like that, Helena? Um. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I yeah. also wanted to ask you: Do you think that it's more exhausting when you play online? I mean, when you're doing long performance online. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if that's because of the posturing, sitting in a chair or um, whatever it is, but there's something about dancing that I think creates a sustainable energy. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to dance in my house or something and I'll, I'll be out of energy really fast, but then I go to an event and I can, I can keep this, this aerobic pace up for hours and hours in a way that seems almost, you know, exceeding my capability or something like that. Um, so I think there's something about when you're in that environment um, that, that you get to a sort of a sustainable level of energy where it's not taking much more effort to stay there. It might take effort to get to that energy level, but it doesn't take effort to keep going. So, you know, like a four hour set and a 12 hour set, they both are just sort of like, I don't know, I just started playing and then it was over after a little bit. You, you know, you just sort of go into a trance and when you come out, you're like, I guess time is irrelevant or something. <laughs> Great. I think our next speaker is also here. Okay. Right, no? Andrea, can you hear is, is he having, can, can you Can you hear us? Can you connect your uh, microphone or camera? Yes. Oh, we see the microphone. Uh, you can unmute it. And you can also connect the camera. 
And you yeah, we will hear you. You can uh, you can connect your camera. Zoom is unable to detect camera. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, guys, I don't know why Zoom is not connecting with my camera, and right now. But I'm can not you? Uh, Lulia, thanks for your talk. So uh, you can, uh, did you plan to present something from your screen? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I'm, I'm quite a noob in, uh, in Zoom. So if you can uh, guide me through, I would be very okay, thankful so, share screen. So, okay. so if, uh, were you planning to share the screen? Mm -hmm. if, so, if so, you can do so using the button on the lower uh, button panel uh, it shows yeah, yeah. I, I, I think i'm on it uh -huh. uh, no, no, no. okay yeah if you press it then you choose the what uh, part of the screen are you sharing or what mm -hmm. specific application it allows you to choose and then, then there you go yeah, yeah i'm actually just uh, loading the presentation so i yes, can uh, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Did you have some some time 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 zone confusion? I'm actually I'm in Berlin right now, and I'm I was hundred percent sure that my time would have been uh, uh, Berlin time. So ah, Berlin time. <laughs> really sorry, uh, I I didn't know simply that it was uh, Russian uh, Russian time. So I I'm really sorry for the yeah, sorry sorry as well. Maybe we didn't make it clear in the instruction. I think we did, but the instruction was quite long, and uh, yeah, it was maybe uh, like hard to find out all details. Uh, our next guests are also from Berlin. They will perform a live techno opera performance after you. Okay, um, I'm almost there. Yeah, and they, they, they are actually uh, thankful uh, for you being late, so they 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 can prepare a bit. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> Uh, we also had a wonderful chance to talk more to Luli because the way she presents is quite uh, impressive and inspiring. Yeah, it's really entertaining. I mean, she's a. a it's a. It was a very good, uh, good talk. Uh, have you um, been? Have you have you been at the CTM festival? Uh, Whether well, she uh, attended a panel about rituals and uh, spiritual uh, concepts and also uh, um, states of mind. Not specifically to that event, uh, I attended a couple of events, uh, but I unfortunately I, I missed that one. Okay. Okay, tell us when you are ready to share. Yeah, I need just uh, 60 seconds, so sure. I can. Okay. One yeah, more day of saving the world conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was a nice. What what sorry? Um, I won't. Um, I won't lie. I just was out of the shower when when Anastasia called me. So I, I'm doing everything like super fast. I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm set up now. Okay, good. Um, So you can you can start the screen sharing uh, as soon as you are ready. Okay, maybe um, in the meanwhile, because Google is asking me for password and stuff, uh, I can start just uh, uh, talking about what I uh, who I am and what I do. Uh, oh. First of all, thank you so much for your interest uh, in uh, uh, in what I'm doing uh, and uh, on the project uh, I'm. Pushing forward, uh, I am Andrea. I am uh, Italian, and I am a 3D artist uh, and uh, art director, uh, working and living in Berlin. And I'm also part of the uh, collective, uh, uh, creative collective, Selemex. Um, together with these guys, uh, we are pushing forward uh, um, a project, uh, uh, many projects of digital fashion, uh, and I will show you in a bit what I'm talking about.
it was it was quite it was quite a day I feel myself a bit exhausted <laughs> not that hard as yesterday but still <laughs> <Good enough. laughs> lena, lena looks here like you're having quite a sunset there uh it's just a lamp oh no <laughs> oh yeah so we have the screen sharing now okay can you see it yeah yeah it's all good perfect okay sorry again okay um so i prepared a, a couple of slides um i want to talk uh, very briefly about uh, the environmental impact of fashion uh, of fast fashion especially um, because of course, uh, like the light motif uh, of uh, the, this whole festival is uh, save the world. So I'm kind of uh, I would like to drive uh, the attention of, on this topic and then move forward. Um, so just a couple of numbers, as you can see, uh, every year uh, 92 million uh, tons of waste uh, and 1.5 trillion liters of water are consumed uh, in the real fashion industry. Um, digital fashion uh, don't want to be, uh, in, in our opinion, the solution to uh, this problem. But we believe that, uh, we at Ceramics believe that this could uh, um, help to tame uh, these kind of effects uh, on, the, on the planet. And I explain you why. Um, so, Maybe it's better if I put this in full screen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, according to a survey in uh, uh, made in uh, UK uh, last year, um, almost one person out of ten purchases uh, uh, items uh, in uh, fashion shops. Uh, just in order to take a picture and uh, show the item, uh, wearing the item uh, uh, on, uh, on social media, on Instagram, uh, and then they would uh, return the item. Um, of course, uh, this kind of, uh, this level, this raises the, the, like, the request of uh, uh, garments uh, uh, in the overall, overall industry. And we think that what digital fashion could do as a first step uh, could be to um, kind of answer uh, at least this um, small part uh, of fashion consumption, of real fashion consumption. Um, we believe that it could be some kind of uh, alternative to this. Um, so, Instead of uh, buying the real article, uh, we could have uh, we, we could think uh, about creating uh, um, um, a ver of creating a, a whole set of uh, of digital fashion clothes uh, and creating uh, um, some kind of digital um, closet. Uh, so each person could uh, we we imagine uh, tomorrow could be um, possible to. Uh, imaging a, a, a situation where uh, people like uh, customers uh, and also um, just users on the on on the social media social media uh, can have uh, basically their own closet, their own wardrobe, um, and uh, just uh, having each clothes uh, available as a, a face filter. Uh, just in the same way you have face filters now, you can uh, basically have uh, um, whatever whatever fashion piece uh, um, available for overlaying on your per person and uh, ready for uh, for a shot. Um, as I was saying, uh, I'm part of uh, Ceramix. Um, Ceramix is a uh, collective, a great collective uh, of about 20 um, 3D, 3D artists uh, and art directors. Uh, um, I, starting uh, in 2019, we uh, we started pushing this kind of uh, um, digital fashion uh, situation uh, forward with many projects. Um, since then, we mastered a little bit the 
the art <laughs> uh, in brackets uh, to create this kind of uh, uh, this kind of items. Um, hey, Andrea, can you can you make a full screen? Um, yes, I can make a full screen. I guess Sorry about that. That, well, that um, should that should be on the view panel. I guess I'm not sure, but maybe present maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I spend my life in front of the computer, but then I get lost in Google Docs. So this is quite funny. Um, so uh, I as I was saying, we we do different kinds of uh, items uh, from clothes, jewelry, shoes. Um, and of course, also virtual avatars. Um, what we have in mind uh, is uh, some kind of fashion universe. So uh, this uh, this is composed by uh, different uh, um, different digital spaces. Uh, this could be a, um, virtual catwalks. Uh, uh, as I said before. Um, augmented reality for social media uh, and uh, and also video games and I will talk uh, later about this kind of implementation um, so as I said as I said uh, uh, the types of implementation could be web web integration or uh, app integration uh, as I was saying before uh, we are imagining some kind of uh, digital uh, digital wardrobe. Um, concerning video games, uh, we noticed uh, that. Uh, I mean, we as three D artists, uh, we we also like to to game, of course. And uh, I mean, one of the peculiar things uh, in most of uh, uh, also tribal A uh, games is the customization, of course, of the avatar. We believe that the, the gamer somehow wants to project his own, uh, his own personality into the character that he's controlling. And uh, also, of course, uh, um, enhance, uh, enhance himself through this, uh, this avatar. Um, and uh, as we can see uh, from the latest trends, uh, uh, more and more uh, gamers are uh, willing to spend their money uh, to customize their avatar. So spending money into uh, not real items, uh, but digital items that have some kind of uh, symbolic uh, enhancing value. Of course, digital fashion is not something that keeps you warm in the winter. Uh, but we believe that it can cover, it can answer um, a specific set of uh, characteristic that fashion, also real fashion, um, is usually uh, trying to answer. So um, uh, I will show you uh, a couple of projects that we are uh, pushing forward. Um, this is specifically um, a, a project, uh, a personal project uh, that I uh, that I created together with uh, my friend uh, Florian, uh, Florian Sigman. Uh, and uh, this was entirely made during the lockdown. Um, therefore, was uh, made uh, primarily um, in remote. And uh, um, the idea behind uh, this project, uh, uh, the concept behind the whole project, was the protection, protecting yourself from the outer world, uh, um, protecting yourself from uh, a generic threat that could harm yourself. Uh, of course, uh, this was uh, directly linked uh, and inspired by the overall uh, crazy situation. Um, this project was done uh, during the probably the worst days uh, that Italy was facing, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> of course uh, these kind of uh, shapes, uh, uh, these kind of puffy shapes, uh, they just want to um, 
talk about protection uh, in a very symbolic way. Uh, there's nothing uh, scientific, of course, uh, behind this idea. Uh, but again, yes, the concept uh, of the of the sewing patterns uh, and of the puffiness of this uh, this oil connect collection was the protection protection ag against the outer world. Um, the other idea uh, that we uh, that we had was the creation of these fabrics, uh, these um, particularly characterized uh, fabrics. And the idea behind this was um, to create some, uh, some new fabrics uh, in a, some kind of generative way, because the process we went through um, involved uh, machine learning techniques. So we would take some, uh, uh, some random images, even from, from Google images. Um, and we would run them uh, together and merge and mix them together uh, through some neural networks. So I don't know if uh, you guys are familiar uh, with GAN, uh, with GAN in general. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yes, we okay. are. So the, um, again, the, the process here was to create uh, this kind of uh, um, fundamentally abstract uh, uh, patterns. Um, and then uh, we used uh, some other uh, process to uh, blend them together with some real uh, world uh, um, uh, fashion fabrics, like in, the, like in this case, uh, leather. So um, this was the outcome. We are uh, quite happy with it. Um, so we, so far, we um, we created four outfits, uh, especially this one. In this one, you can see the the idea of protection is pushed to the limit a little bit. And um, yeah, so um, another project in this uh, direction that we've done uh, was um, uh, we done at the end of the of last year for uh, 032C magazine. Uh, um, they designed uh, a line of, uh, they personalized a line uh, from Adidas. Uh, and together with Ceramix, uh, we created uh, um, uh, a fake mirror, basically uh, an, um, a magic mirror and an, an augmented reality installation. And uh, what it allowed to do uh, basically was to, um, see yourself reflected in this mirror uh, as, a, as an avatar. And uh, what the overall interaction allowed you to do was to basically change the outfit uh, with some simple gestures. Um, on the right, you can see the, the avatar and uh, he's wearing uh, uh, one of the a hoodie and a jacket uh, of the collection. These are more renders from the project. And yeah, I mean, this was kind of a pilot project because um, what, we do, what we foresee, what we think it's gonna happen uh, with digital fashion is not, uh, is not happening only on an app level, not only on Instagram, on social, uh, we believe uh, that, I mean, physical stores will still be there uh, tomorrow. But uh, this is a way we think digital fashion can enter the real stores. Uh, so we imagine that magic mirrors, mirrors could, uh, could be found in, in many stores and can help the customers to easily try on and off uh, uh, different kinds of uh, of outfits uh, and then purchase them. Uh, the same uh, AR technique can be used also, of course, uh, at home or far from the uh, from the digital store. So, sorry, for, from the real store. Um, we use the uh, artificial intelligence uh, also in uh, a bit older project. Uh, we did this project for Days Beauty. And uh, we use the GAN here to basically uh, train the 
to train the neural network uh, to uh, put uh, makeup on uh, models. And uh, yeah, this was some kind of funny uh, outcome. Um, another, another project uh, in this direction that we've done was for uh, Vetaman. Uh, we created an augmented reality app for them. And um, what allowed us to do uh, was to basically overlay some 3D content of, or some um, animated graphics uh, on top of the, of the clothes. So yeah, again, we believe that uh, digital fashion can also be used to uh, basically enhance uh, and uh, uh, real, real clothes is some kind of new uh, layer of, uh, uh, of happening overlaid on top of the real, uh, of the real fashion piece. Yeah, guys, if you want, if you have any question uh, that you would like to ask me about the projects or anything uh, else, please do. So Helena says uh, she have uh, checked uh, your website uh, like a month ago or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because she, because she is working with, uh, with AI. Uh, machine learning and um, AI a lot. Uh, ah, cool. We have a picture on my phone. <laughs> I can see. The... <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so. Uh, also, at this point, I think we have to thank you uh, because we have our uh, Techno Opera from Berlin a live performance waiting uh, to begin. Uh, sure, guys. Uh, I was to... super late and I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry again. I mean, there was a little bit of misunderstanding. No problem at all. I think uh, like we uh, cannot blame you and will not never for that because also, as far as I understand, you have received the instructions only today, <laughs> which yes. is our which is our fault, which is our fault. Uh, so you just said like, you, yeah, I totally uh, like, it's all good, all fine. Thank you for finding time. And, thank you uh, guys, really. Yeah, thank you for being <laughs> so quick with your shower. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, okay. And uh, yeah, well, um, thank you again so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward for the techno set. <laughs> yeah, it will, it will be streamed on YouTube. Cool. I'll be there. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. guys. Uh, Helena, can you say goodbye to everyone? <laughs> Meanwhile, I will... Uh... <laughs> Thank everyone for this wonderful day of talks, uh, discussions, uh, thoughts and ideas. And now um, we're going to see this performance. And, and uh, well, what I wanted also to say that uh, we are already planning the next conference and we already have uh, some lists of incredible speakers again. So see you.
Ich finde Cindy. Ophelia Ich bin Ophelia die der Fluss nicht gehalten hat die Frau am Strick Ich bin Ophelia, die der Fluss nicht gehalten hat. Die Frau am Strick. Die Frau mit den aufgeschnittenen Pulsadern. Die Frau mit der Überdosis auf den Lippen Schnee. Die Frau mit dem Kopf im Gasherd. Gestern, gestern habe ich aufgehört, mich zu töten. Ich bin allein mit meinen Schenkeln, meinen Brüsten, meinem Schoß. Ich zertrümmere die Werkzeuge meiner Gefangenschaft. Den Tisch, den Stuhl, den Boden. Ich reiße die Türen auf, 
damit der Wind herein kann. Und der Schrei der Welt. Ich reiße die Türen auf mit meinen blutenden Händen. Zerreiße ich die Fotografien der Männer, die ich geliebt habe und die mich gebraucht haben. Auf dem Tisch, auf dem Stuhl, auf dem Boden. Ich lege Feuer an mein Gefängnis. Ich werfe meine Kleider in das Feuer. Ich gehe durch die Straßen. Gekleidet in mein Blut.
durch die Straße, gekleidet in mein Blut. Hier spricht Elektra. Im Herzen der Finsternis unter der Sonne der Folter, im Namen der Opfer. Ich stoße allen Samen aus, den ich empfangen habe. Ich verwandle die Milch meiner Brüste in tödliches Gift.
edler Gestalt, seines Mundes Lächeln, seiner Augen Gewalt und seiner Rede Zauberflucht, seine Hände drum und sein Kuss. Gasherd Gäste Gäste 
dann habe ich aufgehört, mich zu töten. Ich bin allein mit meinen Schenken, meinen Brüsten. den Stuhl, den Tisch, das Boden. Ich reiße die Türen auf, damit der Wind herein kann und der Schrei der Welt die Türen auf. Mit meinen blutenden Händen zerreiße ich die Fotografien der Männer, die ich geliebt habe und die mich gebraucht haben. Auf dem Stuhl, auf dem Tisch, auf dem Boden, Feuer in mein Gefängnis. Ich werfe meine Kleider in das Feuer. Ich gehe durch die Straße, gekleidet in mein Blut.
dort oben? So treffen wir uns da.
what is the biggest evil what you can imagine it's midday she killed she killed her child because her man wasn't a good man so she took the revenge Ooh. Mm -hmm. 
werden sie seine Menschen. Und wenn sie seine Menschen um deine Krankheit kämpfte, und wenn ich halten wollte mit einer Kräfte meiner Seelen, und wer er weggeht unter mir, wer er weggeht unter mir, Minute um Minute um Minute, und wenn ich nicht unter mir, und ich nichts finden konnte in meinem Leben, und dann gibt es um diesen einen Menschen festzuhalten, und dann sie seine Menschen, und dann sie seine Menschen, und dann sie seine Menschen, und dann sie seine Menschen.
du mich nicht führst, ich führe dich, weil du mich nicht führst. Ich führe dich, ich führe dich, ich führe dich, ich führe dich. Stirb und werde. Stirb und werde. Stirb und werde. Stirb und werde. 